Please go ahead, sir. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm really excited and thrilled to be the host uh, in my capacity as chairman of the banking vertical of SHM uh, to the elite panel that we have today for uh, the discussion. The topic for today is productive use of financial resources to turbocharge the economic growth. Now this, as you know, is a very complex time that we are passing through. Everybody wants to work. There's so much of energy, but then the circumstances because of COVID are such that we are not able to give our best. There are two Indias at, the, at this point of time, one which is working and one which is not able to work, all because of COVID. Now, in any country which is passing through the stage of economic growth that we in India are passing through, banks play a very important role in this journey. Of course, later on when a country becomes advanced, then the stock market also starts playing a role. But at this point of time in our country, the banking industry has to take the largest burden in the story of economic growth. Keeping this in mind, the panel today that we have and the keynote address that we are going to have is by two leading bankers here. Sunil, Mr. Sunil Mehta, who was the MD of Punjab National Bank and now chairs the IBA, is going to deliver the keynote address and I thank him for accepting our request to do so. We also have Mr. Dinesh. He is Mr. Dinesh, Dinesh Kumar Khara. He is the Managing Director of State Bank of India, the largest bank in the country, with the longest history in our country. And he is also going to be speaking to us and participating in the panel. Then we have Mr. Umesh Ravankar, who is the MD and CEO of Shriram Transport Finance Company and NBFC, which is again an important NBFC, and we are going to listen from him from the NBFC angle. And then we have Mr. Pradeep Goyal, the CMD, Prudent ARC. And you know when banks are in trouble and they need to clean their balance sheet, then Mr. Pradeep Goyal comes and helps us. So the panel that we have today is a very balanced panel for discussion. We have two prominent bankers, one serving and one having gone through the whole mill and now chairing the IBA. And then we have somebody from NBFC and then we have somebody from ARC. Very balanced panel. The issue at hand is financial resources in this country are scarce vis-a-vis -vis the demographic dividend that we have, which means labor is surplus. How do we prudent, prudently how do we optimize these financial resources to, turbo, to turbocharge economic growth? As you know, when we talk of growth, we have in mind labor and we have capital. The country is rich in labor. The country is scarce in capital. And the banks play a prominent role in deciding and prioritizing where the capital goes. And that is why this panel has two prominent bankers to tell us about it. Now we have just about an hour and we have uh, the best speakers that we could have. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to use my time optimally and now invite Shri Sunil Mehta to come and please share with us his perspective and deliver the keynote address. After his keynote address, we will have Mr. Dinesh Kumar Khara to speak to us, and then we will go to the other panelists, Mr. Umesh Revankar, and finally with Pradeep Goyal. If at the end we are left with some time, which we plan to, we will have the question answer sessions. With this, once again, let me welcome all the panelists and the people in the audience to this uh, special lecture, National E-Summit e of SHM. And now let me invite uh, Shri Sunil Mehta to please deliver his keynote address. Mr. Mehta, please. Thank you, Dr. Chandra Singh Ji. Uh, indeed, my pleasure to be here in this panel. 
uh, to share my perspective about the turbocharging of the economic growth in this challenging environment. In fact, the topic itself is very optimistic and challenging when the GDP rate is uh, expected to decline substantially. We may come down to the level of 2% uh, from the 5.5% uh, last year. Uh, when the NPL levels are expected to grow up. So this particular topic is a well thought of topic in the present set of circumstances because it entails the allocation of resources, scarce financial resources to the various segments of the economy and how best we can uh, utilize them to, if not turbocharge, at least to bring out a good growth into the economy because uh, turbocharging requires, uh, yes, a little uh, stronger platform which we have to build up uh, right now. I hope uh, this is possible only by the involvement of all the stakeholders and the important stakeholders in the entire process is uh, uh, definitely government, the regulator or Reserve Bank of India, it is the entire banking system and most important is the entrepreneurial spirit and the entrepreneurs who are uh, parts of the association members also and who are uh, basically the uh, wealth creator of the country and who can uh, really do something to uh, turbocharge the economy. Now let me share with you the perspective of, uh, uh, from my perspective about what has happened uh, during this pandemic. One thing we all must appreciate, uh, our government and uh, our regulator was quite proactive this time. Uh, just uh, soon after announcement of uh, the lockdown in 25th of March, maybe by 27th of March, the regulator came out with certain dispensations to prevent the slippages of the asset quality. So that was a moratorium of 90 days was given, which was further extended to another 90 days. Then they come out uh, for injecting of the liquidity uh, in the form of uh, reducing the CR rate, the cash reserve ratio rate by 1%. Then uh, they have come out with a LTRO window. That is a special window that is a targeted lending for uh, uh, different segments of the uh, which were not getting the funding, uh, just like NBFC. So they said 50% uh, should go to the uh, smaller NBFCs and 50% should go to the larger NBFCs. And the cheaper funds were made available to the banking system to LTRO window uh, so that uh, uh, the illiquidity is eased out. So even RBI intervention has uh, uh, really led to a infusion of liquidity to the extent of 9.5 lakh crore, and uh, that is a rate big enabler uh, for making. Besides this, the regulator has also reduced uh, from last February 2019 a 250 basis point in their policy rates. So that is really helping the banks uh, in improving their transmission of rates, making the capital available at a lower pricing so that their products become more competitive in the present circumstances as well in the uh, international market. So these are few of the major steps which the regulator has taken. Now the government uh, on their part, Yes, uh, government has come out with the Atmanirbhar Bharat um, scheme that is uh, uh, something very uh, ambitious scheme, 20 lakhs crore of uh, uh, package which has been brought out for the country. Uh, the most significant out of which, and uh, uh, I can uh, say that uh, most of this is to be delivered by the banking system only. The most important, uh, the initial part is uh, 1 lakh 70 thousand crore of money was pumped into the needy those who were lose their income during this point of time, they were provided the financial support, which helped them sustain us as well as into the consumption. So that is uh, the money has gone to the uh, women PMJDY beneficiaries. It has gone to the farmers in the, uh, farmers in the form of uh, 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 subsidies uh, in the form of uh, a relief to them. Then it has gone to the M Narega scheme also is uh, uh, given the additional allocations by the government so that migrant labor which moves from the cities to the uh, rural areas to their back home their home they can be gainfully employed uh, during this pandemic time because fortunately our rural sector is doing economically much better in the present set of circumstances than what our urban and metros are doing because the number of cases hike is more in the metro maybe because of the density of the population but the rural area and semi-urban area is still in a most of the areas is a green zone where they are able to operate and perform Fortunately, this year the monsoon is also good, so that will be an enabler for the entire uh, ecosystem because uh, the agriculture sector uh, is uh, even the crystal estimate says that they will be able to uh, go by 2.5 percent, whereas the other sectors might show a decline in trend during uh, this person. So, in the, that macro economic sector, what has been done by the banks? So, in the banking sector, uh, the best thing that has been done is uh, maybe the banking system also equally responded quickly 
the entire banking system has uh, uh, offered 10% emergency line of credit for COVID. And I must appreciate Haraj is there. The SBI was, has took the, taken the lead. And then at IBA level, we have discussed it. And the, all the banks have adopted it. So that 10% line was immediately made available so that whatsoever losses or whatsoever the uh, overhead cost the enterprise suffered during this time, which they are not able to recover during this period, can be taken care of by this 10% emergency, the 10% uh, COVID line of credit. Then uh, we also recommended to the government for coming out with some uh, uh, novel packages for the MSME. And you are all aware that the 3 lakh crore scheme, which has been announced by the government, is one of the best enabler uh, to support the MSME segment. I mean, the MSME segment is really the backbone of Indian economy because after agriculture, this is the second sector which generates the maximum employment. So this is a 3 lakh crore and I'm really happy to share with you uh, more than 1 lakh 14,000 crore has already been sanctioned and 70,000 crore has already been dispersed into, into this particular scheme. The best part is entire funding, which is 20% of the existing fund based limit is guaranteed by the government by, by uh, through a trust. And uh, then this particular guarantee is uh, basically, uh, is a such a simple terms that all those who are existing borrowers they will be given at this limit up to 20 percent immediately without going to the much detailed formalities so that the bottlenecks for sanction and disbursement are taken care of and uh, i'm sure this particular scheme will be a really enabler and a game changer for turbocharging the economy especially into the msme space now uh, the other advantages which the uh, entrepreneurs can avail at this point of time is this subordinate data scheme which has been announced by the government. So uh, 20,000 crore has been uh, earmarked uh, for supporting the subordinate data scheme. There were certain MSMEs which were facing stress even to, during 2019. So all those uh, which are uh, having uh, facing stress uh, from uh, April 19 onward, uh, they will be covered under this scheme where the because whenever the bank will go for any restructuring whenever the bank will go for any uh, incremental lending bank will definitely ask as a prudent lending practice to contribute the margin and many of these msme borrowers may be uh, short of the margin so they may not be having the enough capacities to uh, get the margin so what they can do they can borrow under this window which will be treated as a quasi capital and that uh, subordinated debt, when it will be treated as a capital, collect club with the bank's funding, they can uh, go for even expansion, they can go for even uh, revival of the unit. Uh, so all the stress assets uh, of the MSME, which uh, became stressed uh, during last one year, uh, can be revived uh, under this scheme. Then to uh, bring the MSMEs into the corporate level, the fund of fund that is uh, 50,000 crore was earmarked by the government, uh, which has to be operated by the mother fund and the daughter funds so that uh, all those MSMEs which have grown into the size, uh, they can really take the benefit and go to raise the capital to the capital market. And this fund of the fund scheme is definitely a facilitator into one direction. The another endeavor that has been done is like a global tenders uh, now has been uh, stopped for up to uh, 200 crore. So till 200 crore, uh, the tenders will be all domestic where all our MSMEs and the medium segment will have an adequate scope to participate and they will have advantages uh, over the uh, international participants and players. So uh, these are few of the major steps which the government has taken into the MSME step. Now they are also intending to clear all their dues of the MSME also quickly. Uh, I hope the process has started but it is yet to catch up to the full extent. Now uh, the sectors which are left over uh, which really require attention uh, is uh, some of the aviation, the sector which is a uh, hospitality and the uh, uh, travel and tourism and the hotels and restaurants. So these are the segments uh, which have been impacted greatly during uh, this particular pandemic because uh, occupancy levels were low, traveling was bare minimum and uh, maybe flights were suspended for a, uh, roughly three months. So that has created a biggest uh, cash flow mismatch where they had to incur all the cost from their establishment, the rent, electricities, extra wages cost and uh, so they require a separate address and it can be addressed uh, by all the three. So maybe the government can come out with uh, some special packages to this segment. Even the uh, Reserve Bank can come out with a special restructuring scheme. The RBI, RBI has already recommended to the government, to the RBI to permitting a uh, one-time restructuring of uh, uh, all such type of assets uh, which has uh, faced the problem during this pandemic. Then uh, there can be 
so there can be a support from the banking system also to uh, these segments by restructuring them and uh, deciding about their uh, future cash flows and they can be given a longer tenure to repay their existing stress so these are few of the steps uh, which are required from the institutional side of it but now on the entrepreneur side a lot of efforts is also needed one of the efforts that is needed on the part of entrepreneur is redesigning the business models maybe uh, now the time has come that people have started depending more on digital modes so the digital delivery of our products including uh, in banking and in, in the banking need to adopt about uh, uh, how to go for a digital lending so uh, we have to create the greater platforms right now like the 59minute.com was created but it was created only for in principle approval now how it, that type of platform i'm not saying exactly 59minute.com but that type of algorithm based decision making platform can be expanded for, throughout the entire known life cycle of the credit and how the uh, other type of digital products and the platforms are introduced uh, which makes the lending uh, mainly digital so that the physical interface can be reduced and the speeder and the qualitative decisions can happen faster where qualitative underwriting can happen faster so this is what is needed on the part of the banking now what is needed on the part of the entrepreneur entrepreneur also because the models are changing now people instead of going to the shop they prefer online delivery they prefer uh, online ordering so the entire retail space is uh, going to go for a change entire the food chain is also going to go for a change the entire uh, hotel industry may also require a change a different type of even the real estate may require a lot of changes which was earlier working on a model of uh, uh, going for a building for selling uh, they can may ad adopt a model where they can build for a leasing for residential spaces also because so far the leasing was meant only for the commercial real estate but the housing uh, real estate was uh, uh, not a part of it but now a uh, stage has come where the government has already come out with a schemes for uh, rentals for the affordable housing area the similar type of rental schemes can be worked out for the mid segment also uh, so the concept of a service apartment which is there only for a high end can be uh, moderated and it can be uh, brought out for the mid segment also and then gradually can be shifted to the uh, lower end also so these are the specific changes uh, which the even industry is also required to undertake under the present set of uh, changes so uh, i feel that uh, our country has uh, one of the greatest potential and the greatest potential lies in the people of the india we have the largest younger generation uh, which is going to produce which is going to consume and it is this generation on which every world is every country in the world is looking at they know that they are the they have the people who are young who have the capacities to produce who have the skill set and who have the capacities to consume also because you can't sell anything if there is no consumer in the market and consumer is the human being and the consumer has to be there has to be empowered and that can happen so uh, since uh, in the interest of time it's a topic is very large i think uh, everybody need to uh, play their part but in some instances uh, i think that the today's deliberation will be thought provoking we all will be able to uh, contribute our ideas so that uh, Uh, we can think through uh, how way we can uh, face these uh, challenges of the pandemic and really turbocharge our economy so that not only our declining growth uh, in gdp is uh, reversed uh, and uh, our npl formation is reduced but we are able to provide a fillip and the impetus for the economic growth and with this uh, uh, i i would like to say that uh, please uh, uh, please think through and work out the strategies and uh, find out strategy and let's convey to the uh, masses also that this is all what we can do let's not expect everything from the government because government uh, will do anything will be out of the tax payer money only and that's our money only so if we give the tax to the government and they do the something instead of why don't we do it ourselves as a, so that we can help ourselves and the trust of the economy in my present uh, uh, set of scene is right now we have to redesign it make it more concentrated into the rural area which is well placed to absorb the uh, economic impetus let us do more on to the rural economy do something more for the uh, say msme segment go so these are the segment which will go for consumer empowerment because this money is available in the hands of the consumer and the population automatically the industrial production the industrial consumption will take place so uh, to, to uh, with this uh, i wish that uh, we will be able to uh, come out with this present crisis uh, very successfully it will definitely be depend that uh, how fast the government or the uh, researchers are able to bring out the vaccine and the things come back to the normalcy and then only 
uh, we look also have a certainties of the cash flows into the market for designing or restructuring and designing or all that so that will all uh, thing which we have to wait and watch but meantime we can utilize this time to uh, think through the changes in our existing system and processes the changes in our business strategies uh, to meet out with the uh, uh, to align it with the uh, situation that has been created by the pandemic and i thank the association uh, for providing me this opportunity to share my thoughts thank you mr mehta i must thank you for this excellently well or address that you delivered it's thought provoking it has strategy in it it is out of the box and it is also according to me the most appropriate road map the route which we have to take i think you are very right in saying that expecting the government to do everything is not the right thing in these difficult times we all have to rise to the occasion the policy makers the bankers and most importantly the general public at large we all have to come up and help the country and that's the only way we can turbocharge economic growth thanks for this beautiful thoughts and very good lecture and of course put it very briefly and all in a thought provoking thought provoking manner let's keep moving forward and now i would like to invite uh, mr dinesh khara from state bank of india uh, to share his thoughts with us uh, just because of the time it's 11:32 and we need to close by i think 12:5 uh, i would request each of the remaining members to spend 5 to 7 minutes in a very focused manner and present their mr dinesh khan thank you very much dr charanjit singh ji and also my thanks to sir chem for giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts on a subject which is perhaps very dear to uh, every citizen of the country and more so for a banker because banker being at the fulcrum of the you know, of the economic activity Uh, anything happening good or bad is the something which actually start impinging upon the banking system and the banks in particular having said that i think uh, uh, ever since the covid uh, outbreak happened even just before that we had thought of the, it's like the impact and we came out with the emergency covid line uh, so that it should work as a succor to uh, many of the smes which were uh, expected to get into cash trap uh i think liquidity was one of the major concerns and uh, it was it was something which was immediately addressed by the the bank of india by announcing trtro um, to and then subsequently even by government also when they have come out with a special scheme through which they can uh, render support to various uh, nbfcs and mfis uh actually what was uh, because of the immediate pain the moratorium was something which was immediately granted by the bank of india for practically all the all, all the customers so naturally nbfcs if, when they extended the, the moratorium they were experiencing some kind of an impact on their cash flows so with that in mind uh, the immediate trtr was brought in at uh, at the same time it was also experienced that uh, the the debt market in the country is not all that uh, not all that uh, deep and that is something one of the reasons why even some of the mutual funds also got into some kind of a cash strap and also just to mitigate uh, their hardship uh, the window was offered through the banking system for uh, offering them liquidity for against their various scripts which they were holding so uh, i think liquidity was one of the major concerns which has immediately addressed and i think to to a great extent it has helped the system to remain liquid and uh, now the next issue which is very important is that uh, in, in such a scenario which should be the first sector which we should pick up demand is one of the major concern areas and we had seen uh, the demand was a concern even just before the, the before the covid also but after the covid it got really adversely impacted significantly uh so at that point of time in the current economic scenario if we look at uh, the rural space the rural economy it is the most promising area as of now because one of course they don't have the high density of population so their impact on the on the covid uh, I mean covid impact on the rural population is the very more possible uh but at the same time when it comes to the economic activity overall a major a major part of the economic activity is getting generated from the urban economy and uh, the, i think uh, the at 
that particular piece is the worst affected and that is one of the reasons why why perhaps april was the worst affected month but towards may and june towards june i would say that uh, second half of june maybe uh, two fortnights of june we have started seeing some kind of a credit growth and that credit growth is essentially because when the unlocking uh, started happening and uh, the economic activity was restored and also at the e-commerce e was permitted uh, so that is something which has helped in terms of revival of some bit of a demand but yes of course as of now as far as the economic system is concerned there is a huge liquidity which is available in the system but at the same time the the credit offtake is very limited and uh, to encourage that even rbi has come out with relaxation of lef norms also and the uh, lef norms uh, relaxation has helped some of the large corporates to even get their uh, I mean, come out and to uh, for subscribing of their debt paper and also uh, uh, i think it will go a long way because eventually we'll have to identify that which could be the major growth levers which can deliver immediately and i think to that extent we'll have to have the large corporates who can uh, who have got the ability who have got the resilience to withstand this kind of a covid pressure and at the same time the rural economy which has got a ability to really feed into the supply chain of the large corporates so i think if at all these can be the two uh, major growth levers immediately which we can really leverage and the, the next will come the sme so once they will start fueling the economy with the necessary liquidity then perhaps msme and the kind of support which has been extended by way of a partial credit guarantee scheme by way of uh, the liquidity for the for the msmes by way of extending refinance to uh, from the sidb so these are the various measures which have been taken for for promotion of uh, the sme and also the uh, the recent atmanirbhar bharat package which has really opened up the vistas of growth in the in, in the days and years to come i think it will go a long way in terms of really fueling the growth ambition of uh, of this economy uh, perhaps you know the the new value chain in terms of uh, the warehousing etc which needs to be really brought in the infrastructure sector in terms of road etc which can actually work very well in terms of supporting the the growth at this point of time in fact i will uh, i would like to draw a parallel to something like uh, what we witnessed in us around the time of the great recession they actually built their road network around that uh, around that point of time and that is something which helped in creation of job and creation of demand and uh, in creation of opportunities for the for the economy to be more fuel efficient and uh, and, and more economic so i think from that point of view this atmanirbhar bharat which has been brought in this is this is very promising and it can actually help this indian economy to be self sustainable and at the same time meet the ambition and aspiration of growth for each one of us so i think i'll limit myself here because of the of the time constraint but yes of course any questions i'll be more than happy to respond thank you very much uh, mr dinesh i think we are all now going around to the fact that rural economy has to be looked at and the atmanirbhar bharat that has been brought in right now which i look at it from a revised version of make in india and a more cl clear version the clear road map i think is becoming important with this let me now move on just because of paucity of time and thank you very much for staying within the time limit uh, i would like to now move on to mr umesh revankar the md and ceo of shriram transport finance company and nbfc which works at the grassroots level in extending credit to those segments where banks sometimes can't reach or don't want to reach so mr umesh uh thank you doctor uh thank you uh asucham uh, for giving me this opportunity and i'm very happy to be uh, along with uh, very senior bankers and uh, large bank both because it gives a good perspective for us uh, how uh, we are looking at indian economy now and both the bankers uh, have uh, said and suggested that uh, rural economy and maybe msme need to be immediately looked into because that's where the credit need is and probably it will propel 
and yes uh, what is most important is creating demand and creating demand is possible only by creating uh, employment and uh, consumption now the how the employment will get generated how the consumption will uh, come we believe as uh, dr rightly said uh, uh, most of the nbfc including us we are in a segment most of us are in a niche segment we are a vehicle finance company there is a gold finance company and there are some sme funding companies so we are in a niche we live with this uh, customers and we have a necessary skills and expertise to understand the business and deal with them so this expertise has built been over the period it is not uh, just four or five years back this most of the nbf started we started for 40 years now been there and remained in that particular uh, uh, expertise niche segment we don't try to have very broad based uh, uh, lending uh, category now in india entrepreneurship is always appreciated uh, more than the people who are employed for example a truck owner is more appreciated than maybe a driver even sometimes the owner may not take home enough money driver may take home more salary so that's the situation so the indian system ecosystem is such where a entrepreneur are appreciated therefore many young people want to get into entrepreneurship and when they get into entrepreneurship many of them may not have track record or they may not have the credit history and when they do not have this who is to lend them so that's where the NBFC comes into the picture. Most of the NBFC, they, because of their experience and niche presence, they understand the business and they encourage the people who borrow for the first time or become entrepreneur become for the first time. And that's where uh, we actually complement the bank because what happens is uh, we make these people who are wanting to be the owner or business uh, run the business enterprise for the first time and hold them then when they become reasonably large build track record or history credit history then they move on to bank so NBFC continuously keep doing this so we bring people into mainstream and therefore NBFC has to be seen as a complementary large mail connection into this uh, in, in, in India because India has a large population and entrepreneurship urge is so large, it cannot be met by the uh, banking system. Because most of the banking system over the period have moved into centralized banking. The credit course, the credit system, the entire uh, process is so centralized. It, it gives very less scope for a local bank manager to take a call or decision or do something uh, which a local uh, need or maybe a rural area or maybe town uh, that particular area somebody wants to do something i don't think any branch bank branch today would be able to uh, appreciate and engrave or lend to them so because of that the NBFCs are playing more and more important role so we should the NBFC should become a part of the banking system complementarily. So funding to NBFC should become more uh, easier than what it is now, because now the, uh, the central government has come out with uh, some schemes, RBI has come out with uh, uh, TROs, but it's not reaching to NBFC the way it has been emphasized, even though there has been attempt to bridge uh, the uh, banks and NBFCs because in between NBFCs, we are dependent on uh, the, uh, I should say, capital market mutual fund because it was easy, faster, you can raise and cheaper. But that is virtually drying out because of redemption pressure there or they are trying to get out of uh, NBFC sector. So the only option for the NBFCs have been uh, being part of the uh, banking system. and. Uh, and one more thing, what is important to understand is at the village level, the only way to create a sustainable uh, employment or sustainable business model is buying an asset. 
how they uh, at village level self employed uh, become asset owner is they buy a truck or tractor machinery today backhoe loaders and machineries are quite common to be seen even in the rural area so people buy this and when they buy it the nbf is funded and these are all asset creation and sustainable business opportunity so i think the bank and nbfc complementarity is very important and uh, maybe we can even we have even focus mostly in the private sector area it need not be spread across all segments and i want in the private sector whatever banks want to lend today that can be done through uh, the nbfc more efficiently and maybe faster uh, there are, there are uh, the, many of the private banks they want to do securitization but securitization happens won't after be building the asset after seasoning of 6 months or 9 months then but initially to start the business build the business you need on, on uh, balance sheet lending which is something which i feel if it all we are able to bridge between bank and nbfc and on balance sheet lending it becomes smoother especially for private sector i think we can reach out to many more people uh, in this current circumstances and maybe going forward we can uh, make it better with the business model can be bridged much better so that's what i feel and uh, even though there is uh, some uh, coal lending options are there but coal lending options are not available for every nbfcs deposit taking nbfcs it's not available other nbfcs are available but i understand that wherever it is tried there also the scaling becomes a difficult because nbfc customer need to be fitted into banking credit screen that becomes difficult now each 2 lakh loan getting getting into the banking credit screen it is not a scalable model so that becomes a challenge so we need to build a scalable smoother and faster uh, lending model between banks and nbfc that should definitely assure that the current circumstances the credit flows into the uh, uh, the needy very fast thank you thank you mr umesh i agree with you the seamless interconnection between the banks and the nbfcs is really important now whatever said and done and for whatever reasons that mutual trust is not there and i am noticing it myself and i am worried about it also and that is why i think some has something has to be done so that the flow of money follows the flow of trust between banks and nbfcs uh, just because we are running out of time uh, i'm going to go straight to mr pradeep goel who is the cmd of prudent arc and uh, i would request him if he could restrict his views to 5 to 7 minutes and then we will take a question or two there's already a question we have received from mr sunil matter i've just sent him on his cell phone Uh, and then after that we will request him to respond mr pradeep goel sorry sir uh, pradeep sir you are on mute please unmute yourself yeah my audible now yeah sir yeah thanks thanks dr sain and thanks association for inviting me to this on the forum and is on this webinar to deliver and, and uh, listen to news of such learned and renowned people in the industry i am not first of all i like to say good afternoon to dr singh dr ms sunil mehta mr ara mr omesh rendu ladies and gentlemen indian democracy as we all know is for the people and by the people we are responsible in our own way as citizens and institutions and so on let's come forward to build our nation that is a basic thought which that every that is coming to everyone's mind today current government role is highly that we are very fast and efficient decision makers in the best interest of the nation which has never been seen before in the industry like this one you know i'm very impressed 
about the condoms working. That ERC comes into the picture when an account becomes bad or there are a lot of non performing assets, non performing accounts in the system. And ERC's goal is to preserve mythical wealth by working, to, working hard towards revival and rehabilitation of Indian businesses, industries, and accounts, resulting in sustained growth of tax collection and continued to GDP ordination. But also help generate environment employment, thus resulting in overall nation, national sustained development and growth. The way things are, by the way, I'm also with this uh, to add, I'm also vice of the association and keep on listening to views from various industry experts and uh, from various sectors. The RC is right now a neglected sector. It's role that needs to be recognized as nation builders. A lot needs to be done so that ARCs are able to deliver their best. Else is expecting firing without beliefs. We need support in a positive way from all stakeholders. It is the regulator, it is the investigating agencies, the banks, and the government. We need our issues to resolve in the right way. Wherein we are able to deliver with the ease of doing business to avoid complexities and focus on our core area of rebuilding nation and reviving and, and recovering the best possible money for the banks and also helping the civil industry and businesses, not by killing them. As today, we see a lot of ways and means being adopted, the businesses are getting killed. Today, everything is at same for 10 cents to a dollar, or we say. 15 pesos to rupee. Aim is to get maximum 50 pesos, 70 pesos to rupee, where we save our bankers' capital. And also, service provider, we are able to deliver our best for everybody's interest. As I already said, towards the nation, for the government, for the people, for the banks, and the great environment and sustained businesses. Though I will not be very, very memory, I will be very, very short. And I would like to add, there have been talks of bad men. There are existing 20 ARC. SBI is also SBI to elevate the boost of the article, wherein SBI has come out with an ARC with a certain set of mind of power sector investments. There has to be a level playing field for all ARCs, and be, there has to be a problem solution. Otherwise, how can the ARC be there? So, we need to address the ARC issues for the expecting them to deliver, and uh, we are here to provide our services to the banks, to the government, and work for nation's development. That would be all. Thank you very much. Uh, I must thank you, Mr. Uh, and now, uh, it, I think Rajesh, would you like to mute yours because some disturbance is coming? Um, uh, Mr. Pradeep, uh, I understand you've concluded your presentation. Yes, please. Yeah, there was little disturbance while you were making a presentation, and probably that by including part I couldn't, but that is okay. I'm sorry for that, Mr. Mehta. No, there's a question that has come for you, and uh, would you like to respond to that? Sure. Now, now well, there's a series of questions, so I'll res respond in a short. Um, the first question uh, that has been uh, that has come to me is uh, at least. Uh, for next two financial years quarters, Indian industry needs to get back to 7% annual growth rate. Which sectors can do turbocharge just now? So the question is very relevant. Uh, the sectors uh, which really need focus and can really be handled at this stage is, one is the infrastructure sector, because that is one sector where government can provide a fillip uh, by restarting all those infrastructure projects uh, uh, which are in the pipeline and uh, maybe which are held, uh, which are held up because of one reason or the another reason. So infrastructure sector can definitely propel the demand for cement, steel, uh, ancillary items, and then of course the uh, labor. 
so that will be a good employment source and most of this infrastructure happens outside the uh, metro areas uh, so what sort happens much sort of the metro areas their availability of the labor and the uh, uh, spread of pandemic uh, is also quite low so that is one area which can pick up quickly the another area which can be turbocharged is the affordable housing because uh, as rightly said a lot of people have migrated to the rural uh, to tier three cities also and all of them will require some housing so affordable housing is given a fillet and if that is the one thing which is supported by all the sectors by the real estate owners as well as by the government as well by the rural authorities and the entire ecosystem then that is one area uh, where it, it can be constructed even for a rent model and it can be constructed uh, even for a development third has already uh, stated uh, the msme and the agriculture sector because agriculture it is a thinly populated area and the monsoon is good this is especially a, a kharif season is going on so if this segment if we concentrate little more provide them later more credit available make them make credit available provide them little more imports the government will also come up with certain more incentive few of them they have already done like better support prices then this is the segment which can really uh, propel the growth because there the demand as well as the employment both will be uh, created uh, so uh, agriculture msme uh, or affordable housing and uh, infrastructure can be the key focus areas uh, for all the entire ecosystem uh, coming to the next question it is a uh, so uh, one question is how can we help uh, provide a helping hand uh, to serve and uh, serve them uh, especially the migrant laborers and uh, so that they can live with dignity and social benefit so everyone has a got a scope to do that maybe uh, wherever there are people working for us uh, we can take care of them wherever we have a units uh, uh, which are already established in the rural semi urban area where the migrant population present if we uh, go for expansion in those areas we can generate additional employment for them we can gain fully utilize their services uh, wherever affordable is real estate sector want to do they can create for uh, affordable housing projects in these, those areas in the tier 2 tier 3 cities so that will provide them housing also as well as the employment and demand also so uh, then there are a lot of novel ways in which uh, we can support the migrant labor uh, one of the ways in this in way we can support is because nobody would, the charity will will not go but the employment generation option so if uh, all those who are in a position to spare their wealth and create some employment opportunities uh, in the rural semi urban they can start their new ventures into these areas uh, so that will definitely help the people uh, to get employed in their own area instead of migrating to the metro areas so um, uh, government can also incentivize this and as a people of india we can also think through that okay we are done done enough for the uh, urban population let us do something for the rural and the uh, semi urban areas so that's the way uh, we can support uh, this segment and uh, uh, the next question is sorry so lockdown happened on 22nd march in previous financial year means 10 days earlier in previous financial year then how banks are doing pay cut and other cut and it should be next financial year situation don't curve so basically the uh, banking system uh, i think uh, uh, you all are uh, must be fully aware that uh, bankers have worked like a covid warriors so even when nobody uh, in industries was going to their offices nobody was there uh, bankers were there in their branches uh, catering to the masses uh, they were uh, they are unsung heroes of the covid war because they were there in the branches facing the challenges and providing the uninterrupted services i think nowhere they, the banking services stop uh, because we have the data the 98% of the banking system was operating uh, it was uh, the providing services and entire uh, value chain in the time of atms in the time of uh, transaction banking every internet banking because all these things need the support of the human being from the back end so packet is not in the minds of the banker uh, we are not thinking through it rather we would like to earn more and spend more uh, for the because uh, let us let the banking sector attract more talent about it uh, let the banking sector get better people about it because that is one sector which is the backbone of the economy and which work even in the pandemic like this uh, where the life uh, threat to the human life is more there so it's not uh, in the minds of the bankers for a packet what is in the minds of the people is uh, providing equitable and a better remuneration to them so that it attract the best talent uh, in the banking industry now the next question is uh, 
So ease of uh, doing uh, banking and IBA to come out with the reform framework to resolve this. So as uh, very rightly said, and uh, uh, yes, uh, ease of doing banking is the one thing in the agenda of IBA, and we bankers uh, in our uh, meeting are now thinking through it. Uh, I myself has given the suggestion that yes, for ease of doing bankers, the bankers will gradually have to uh, move uh, their models to be a more swifter delivery, a faster decision making. And uh, one example I quoted was of the 59 minutes.com for MSME segment. Same model, same type of models can be uh, scaled up uh, when the other banks can design, banks can design their own models where faster deliveries can happen, especially into the uh, retail segment, into the MSME segment. And I must share with you, uh, most of the banks are already working on it. Uh, they have done their developing products in this line. This pandemic is a uh, threat. Uh, the banks are converting into an opportunity for digitization of the, their loan product. The process is on, but everything, if you know it's a transit phase, uh, it will take some time to build it up. And uh, maybe uh, six months from now, you will find more of the digital lending products available in the market, uh, which will help and facilitate the ease of doing uh, banking. And uh, transaction banking, I think, has already been eased out. You all were able to do transactions from the uh, comfort of your home uh, by just by internet banking, just by uh, drawing from the nearest ATM. So I think. Uh, the banking has transformed during the last 10 years. It is going to transform further. And these improvements are really needed to which bankers are uh, early when uh, are working on it. Uh, and the last question is. So it's a basically remark that the corporates are not doing much for the poor. It is the government which is doing. But yes, uh, whoever is doing or not is not a debate. Uh, this is the collective responsibilities of all the citizens of the India that in case of crisis, in case of yeah, and that is the beauty of the Indian uh, people that whenever there is a crisis, we get unite better, we start thinking through and this uh, pandemic has given us a thought, a food for thought. We have, it has created more passion in the mind of a, you know, that yes, uh, we have to work for our fellow people. There are a lot of underprivileged people who need to be helped and supported this. I must appreciate the large number of voluntary organizations have come forward and done it. And all of us can contribute it, maybe if not in the form of uh, doing it physically, we can contribute to some of the organizations. We are really doing good job in this area. So it's a collective responsibility. Those who have can uh, spare something for those who have not. So have and have nots can be taken care of. Uh, if we have a develop an empathy and start contributing, maybe uh, by creating employment for them. If we are entrepreneur, by contributing to the voluntary organization, for supporting them in the distress time. So all of us got a scope to contribute uh, for the well-being of our uh, fellow citizens. And that is uh, my submission. And uh, if there is any other question, you are welcome. I must thank uh, Mr. Mehta for taking the questions. I'm going to go to Mr. Dinesh now. I think he must have received some questions which I have sent to him. And uh, now the issue is, uh, you know, we all like to bash the corporates. But I always tell one thing, the corporates provide employment to many, many people. They also provide us global recognition. Of course, handicrafts, village and cottage industry also does that, but corporates also do that. Corporates also contribute in large amount to the tax kitty, as well as by giving employment to many others, income tax through them and expenditure tax through their employees. So bashing the corporates always, is not the right thing. They are, in this case, when in the rest of the world, unemployment allowance was paid by the government of the USA and the UK and other advanced countries, just because the prime minister made an appeal to the corporate sector, they ensured that the salaries are paid to their employees, even when they did not come to office for a single day. So therefore, as uh, Mr. Mehta said, rightfully, Everybody has to play a role and we, there has to be mutual trust and respect for each one in the society. Taj Mahal was not built just by the king. There were also many artisans who were working on it on daily basis. Somebody had a vision, somebody had an architectural plan and somebody had to be physically doing it. Everyone in the society is important. Now, I would like with this to go to Mr. Dinesh. I hope you have received the question which we have sent and I, I can just read it and I hope you have received it, Mr. Dinesh. Or should I yeah, just what, read it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a question. I, yes. One of course is 
uh, as far as the liquidity is concerned it is all provided by the bank uh, by the rbi and uh, uh, what is being done by the banks so i think uh, more than that uh, one what we have supported through the ltro and tr ltro apart from that we have actually witnessed a growth of about 31000 crore in our investment book form uh, this year onwards which is ytd so uh, i would like to mention that you know uh, rbi provided liquidity for the ltros but nevertheless since we are all uh, having lot of liquidity placed with us and we are there to support uh, the uh, any of the efforts which are being put in by even the large corporate small corporate mid corporate so that is something which is being attempted and even for the nbfcs and uh, the mfis which are not having any instruments we have indicated very clearly if at all they are uncertain about their cash flows it is better that they should come for loan proposal as against the investment proposal so that is something which we are encouraging each one of them because when it comes to investment it is actually more dicey for any smaller entity which is not really aware of what the implications could be so we are encouraging them that they should rather take loans uh, so that is something which gives them a some kind of elbow room if at all they have got uncertainty of the cash flows the second question which has come is that just got news indian banks are in, in for a 20 trillion hole i think it is anybody's estimation whatever they are doing i'm not in a position to comment on that but what would be the revival plan as far as the, as far as the revival plans are concerned i think we are very closely monitoring all such accounts where we have received the request for the moratorium and as we have gone on the court saying that the moratorium request which we have received in the personal loan in particular we don't have much of a challenge and uh, in the sme sector where we have we have received the moratorium request we are very closely monitoring what are their cash flows what are the reasons for uh, this their cash flows becoming choked and how we can really help them in in tidying over this kind of a problem so we are quite open to look at uh, the request of msmes for the rehabilitation or restructuring also and i'm quite hopeful that uh, maybe in due course even uh, with the help of the regulators also will be in a position to frame some kind of a scheme through which we can help uh, the, the msme sector who are in a real distress as uh, i mean particularly when it comes to hotels particularly when it comes to uh you know uh, these kind of industries which have suffered the most they will probably need some kind of a hand holding and uh, uh, we are quite open to look at uh, the uh, with their requests very kind of very searching evaluating their cash flows and the certainty of the cash flows uh and as far as uh, arbi governor has, uh, has also gone on record saying that uh, the bank should uh, look at uh, the likelihood of the losses and also try to recapitalize so i think each one of the banks should be making their own assessment and uh, depending upon their assessment they will be working out the ways and means through which they will be in a position to raise the capital so that is something which will be uh, which is a task for the, each of the management and um, uh, practically all of them are clued to this particular situation and they are all working out the ways and means which they can provide stability to the financial sector going forward i must thank you and we should now conclude um, with this session uh, once again i want to thank each one of you the keynote speaker mr dinesh during his working hours to come and uh, speak to us mr omesh and mr pradeep uh, i would also like to remind that we had Uh, we had an appointment from the minister of state uh, today to be with us mr anurag singh thakur but he couldn't join us but he has promised us that at the very first possible opportunity that we organize another seminar he is going to be with us so i must thank him for that also let me then now conclude the session and say um, that we are there we have a consensus that there is so much of possibility available within the country we can turbocharge people have the resilience and the resources rural area is one area which we need to explore atmanirbhar bharat has come at the right time the banks and the nbfcs there has to be mutual trust arcs have started to play a role and they'll continue to play a prominent role in days to come especially after covid opening takes place and we do not know what shape and the uh, npas are going to take and therefore arcs will have a role to play each one of us has a role to play 
in turbocharging the economy in a nutshell that is the message which the keynote address and the panelists provide with this once again thanks to all let me conclude this session thank you thank you thank you very much thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Agarwal, and good afternoon, Mr. Bair. Yeah, good afternoon, Mr. Sisadri ji. Yeah, Mr. Rajat Bair, good afternoon. Dr. Charan Singh ji, good afternoon. I, uh, you know, I was yeah. listening to your session. It was excellent. You are you are very good anchor and moderator. <laughs> very good, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is all teamwork. You get a good team yeah, to yeah. speak, and then the job of the moderator is simply to summarize it. Right. Yeah. The team was but very you did good. A very good job. Thank you. The team was yeah. very good. You know, more I'm thinking, yeah. Sheshad, it is a fact that there is a gap between banks and and uh, NBFCs. That gap okay. needs to be to be somehow filled, yeah. and then it becomes seamless. And that's becoming apparent now in every meeting that comes out so clearly. Correct. We have the next panel. The difficult problem to solve. Yeah. The... Wonderful. Thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, I don't know whether we are uh, live. I think we're supposed to go live at 12.15. Just waiting for our other colleagues to join. And then we'll start. Good afternoon, Mr. Raman. How are you? Uh, sorry, I was on mute. Good afternoon to everybody. Yeah, good afternoon, Raman. Mr. Raman. So we're just waiting for 12.15, at which point we will... Hello. You know, this uh, mechanism of bringing everybody together digitally is so interesting and we get to share so much of knowledge with each other rather than spending time commuting on the roads. I'm so happy yeah. to see Mr. Rajat Bahal here, who's the chief rating officer of Brickwork, Brickwork Ratings. And uh, Mr. Bahal, uh, if you don't mind, after this, would like to speak to you and understand uh, how are you going to be handling the ratings in the post COVID world for the standard rating model, which I am familiar with, uh, would have taken a very severe hit uh, during this time. And by the time we come out of the COVID, uh, I think your rating models uh, will need a reason. So uh, not online, but offline. 
I'd just like to learn from you how you are preparing for that. So I'll, I'll get a telephone number from Rajesh and we will chat on this. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, uh, I think now we are uh, we have forum. Uh, we are uh, bang on time at twelve sixteen. So I thank you all for being online and listening to this uh, very very interesting session. Uh, we have a stellar panel with us uh, who represent various areas of the industry and have uh, incredible experience uh, that we will be, um, you know, uh, gaining from at this point in time. The, the, the object of this uh, webinar was to understand how financial resources could be used well. And within that, uh, to understand how we may actually restart the economy, how the bank system can restart the economy and um, I think that's a very very good question given uh, the situation that we are in and we thought that we would break that up into basically four sub questions and in the interest of time address it in two parts the first question is to understand from the various participants here and the participants here are senior leaders of industry they are uh, you know leaders in their respective realms to understand from them which parts of the economy are indeed functioning uh, well, which parts of the economy are facing some challenges, and whether those challenges are on account of demand-related issues or whether they are on account of supply-related issues. So if we could address that question first, we would then in the second round go and understand what the financial system can do to help industry meet the demand side issues as well as the supply side issues and subsequently spend a few minutes in the second round to talk about you know additional help that the financial services sector would perhaps need either from the government or from society at large to enable them to perform their activities even better than what they are currently doing so with that uh, let me turn this over to mr bell who is the head of ratings for brickworks and he is on the hot seat at this point in time because uh, according ratings uh, in an environment such as this must not be an easy task. Uh, but he has a unique insight, I think, yeah, into how the economy in general is working. So over to you, Mr. Bell. You have to unmute yourself. We can't hear you, Mr. Bell. We can't hear you, Mr. Bell. Sir, please remove your headphones. Can you try speaking now, Mr. Bell? Well, I think uh, we'll have to come back to Mr. Bell in a bit once we resolve the uh, technological challenges. Uh, let me uh, request uh, Mr. Nath, who runs a, a finance company which deals with uh, perhaps the most uh, impacted set of customers. Maybe we can hear from him. Uh, what he thinks about the first question. Thanks, Mr. Shishadri. Uh, you are right that uh, you know we are a uh, uh, non-bank finance company, which has started its journey around two, three years back, and we focus predominantly on SME and micro SME segment. Uh, and you are right that this is one of the most impacted uh, sector, uh, you know, across the landscape, uh, probably in the corporate, other than real estate and commercial and residential real estate. 
the way uh, from where we sit and you know if we look at the lens uh, we spend last uh, three months uh, beside what doing a lot of internal work uh, in reaching out uh, at a, you know through our data analytics platform to the large base of our small business customer and given that we are a you know sector specialized uh, non-bank finance company wherein we only focus on eight sector we could actually figure out where we think uh, is the biggest stress uh, when it comes to SME and micro SME businesses. What our uh, reach out to these SMEs has told us one that at the beginning of the pandemic, most of the small businesses felt that they can survive for at least three months period. Beyond three months period, it would be difficult for survival. And obviously it varies uh, for different sectors. So for example, hospitality was the most impacted, auto component was second most impacted, then third was, uh, you know, uh, some of the, uh, services sector and in that also the you know uh, businesses or a small business which is outside the main uh, city cluster were lesser impacted uh, and as we entered into what I call pandemic 2 where everyone expected that it would be a three month phenomena now it is looking at six to eight month nine month or longer phenomena uh, we are actually seeing revival uh, wherein other than some of these sectors which we have said anyone who has not been into the you know main hub of bombay or chennai or bangalore we are seeing a revival to the extent of almost 60 to 70 percent in terms of the business volume and turnover of these businesses uh, but i think so one of the biggest challenge beside you know migrant labor you know manufacturing capacity and so on and so forth is the availability of credit because majority of these small businesses if you look at them they operate at a 10 percent plus margin uh, for a year a three month shutdown means that their entire year margin is wiped out not that they are they would die down but they need uh, extended credit or cash flow support uh, uh, which helps them to pass through this period uh, so whatever limited way we can do that we are doing that but i think so you know Whatever liquidity support is coming, it is coming towards surviving financial institutions, but more support is needed in surviving this underlying SME and micro SME. Uh, with emergency credit line has definitely helped, but I think so is not enough. Uh, Mr. Shradri, you are uh, you, broke, uh, you broke up there and you said emergency credit line is not enough or is it enough? Is, no, I said that emergency credit line is good, but it's not enough. Uh, there is more direct support uh, to SME and micro SME needed to be provided through some form of, uh, you know, government have massive, you know, GST data. So to give you an example, you can do a pre-COVID, post-COVID turnover data analysis and basis that, you know, create an extension of support program. Uh, and that is definitely needed for survival of uh, and revival of SME and micro SME segment. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nath. I think, um, unfortunately, the message you're giving us is not a particularly positive one, uh, but we will debate that subsequently. Let me go to uh, request Mr. Agarwal, who is the uh, chairman and managing director of the SMC Group, which is the business of actually providing large-scale employment. Uh, so maybe, you know, since he's dealing with various types of industries, he will have a view as to which is doing well, which is doing badly. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Sisadri, for giving me a chance to speak. I think uh, the package given by the government uh, for liquidity and support to MSME and all other businessmen and migrant labor, poor farmer, and everyone, uh, though it was uh, con seeing the constraint of the country and resources, uh, it was uh, not. Uh, it is uh, it is reasonable, but the country needs more, and uh, the problem is more because before COVID-19, economy was suffering a lot. Uh, our GDP a little bit down, and NBFC sector was suffering uh, because of so, so many problems of big uh, NBFC like DHFL, ILFS, and all other. So liquidity problem was already there, and uh, NB was, NBFC were not providing. Uh, lending to other sector so all other consumption was low demand was low and uh, because of that economy was little bit affected so uh, we require a lot of packages earlier before covid 19 and though government has announced and they are doing fast they have uh, given the notifications and uh, they are 
providing whatever the resources they can according to that but uh, sme sector as you uh, 80 to 90 percent sme is an unorganized sector they don't have collateral still they are not getting funds and uh, it is this fact you, uh, it can be verified that in march april even 8 lakh crore was with the rbi on repo at a very low interest of 3.75 percent so that trust was missing between bank and the borrower and so we have to bring back that trust uh, banks should start lending recently they have given loan uh, to the borrower but still a uh, lot of challenges are being faced by the borrower and i think uh, if that trust come back bank started uh, lending and th then i think uh economy will revive and the government has to spend lot of money on infrastructure instead of uh, they have should increase manrega and all that because uh, uh, spending on uh, infrastructure it will have multiplier effect so uh, go, uh, businessman needs such efforts by the government and, uh, and uh, still one more package is expected by the businessman a lot has to be done by the government and i am not saying that we must uh, depend upon the government but uh, initially since our 3 4 months back activity was totally shut down and we require lot of activity to be started or to be uh, in fast mode and uh, uh, and if you use see the uh, those government is claiming 10% of gdp the financial package but in real sense if the fiscal uh, package you can say just one on one and a half percent of the gdp though other countries like us uh, uk and other countries are also doing in the same way but they are they are 50% of their their fiscal support is 50% at least so uh, i think uh, government is doing the right job but still Uh, expectation from businessman side is much more and uh, it can be uh, if government can support more they should support more and it is needed uh, so all sector uh, wise it is needed thank you thank you thank, thank you mr agarwal uh, very uh, very insightful uh, comments let me uh, request uh, neepa seth who is the founder and director of uh, trust capital one of india's largest fund houses or rather um she's one of the important players in the bond market and um, she probably has a unique view as to where activity is actually happening because only folks who are active will be accessing the markets at this point in time so therefore uh, nipa if you could tell us what you are seeing where is the activity happening where is the demand shortfall etc so thank you very much uh, shashadri ji uh, it's nice to be on a, a platform like this on uh, friday morning and uh, yes of course we have seen a huge impact which is you know because of pandemic and industries are suffering however we have seen timely steps taken by rbi in terms of ensuring that the liquidity comes in in the system and it was done very proactively by end of march where we saw beginning of tltros and uh, though initially it was a primary and a secondary which allowed a uh, you know the entire panic in the credit market which got created probably partly from mutual fund redemptions and certain industries not doing well i think the entire piece was covered pretty well <laughs> So according to me the first tltro which was done by rbi allowed the industry to settle down from the panic sale and the liquidity which was not there in the market the markets did soothe and i think uh, apart from that we are seeing more than 5 lakh crore of liquidity on a consistent basis over last one quarter uh, which has allowed the rates to go down the effective rate is a reverse repo rate and not a repo rate which again i think we are seeing it after a couple of years which has allowed the banks to take ensuring that any uh, overhang in the system in terms of uh, instrument which was looking for liquidity has come in we are also seeing uh, that there is appetite of risk is very low but the triple a's and the psus have been able to borrow at phenomenal rates uh, first time we are seeing uh, you know cp is being placed anywhere between 3 3 and a half for a psu issuer on a consistent and on a size basis which will allow eventually for the uh, banks to you know put the money in the credit cycle also 
seen the scheme of government which was partial credit enhancement and uh, we've seen an offtake started to happening on that front i think a lot has happened on the financial segment to ensure that the stability of mutual funds are taken care of and a lot for the corporates and nbfc special window of 20% government guarantee and even the vehicle which we are looking from the sbi perspective so i think in terms of nbfc though there would be nps given you know what we are seeing in a prolonged lockdown i think a liquidity is fairly taken care of however what needs to probably look at is some of the other segments which will have huge impact uh, it could be entertainment it could be hospitality and there could be ltros in a funding mechanism which can come from that segment as you know uh, sachinanath had also mentioned that what has been done is a lot but you know a lot needs to be done further so i feel one or two uh, similar steps to ensure that the credit goes to the right segment and right now it will be more about survival and you know post that once we see normalcy there will be growth but ample of liquidity a lot of uh, acceptance in the market for a lot of instruments which is great so i think rbi and finance minister probably gone in the right direction in terms of creating financial stability thank you thank you very much nipa very uh, very insightful comments let me just turn to uh, mr raman who is the managing director of national e governance uh, limited i hope i got that right raman you have a unique view because you are seeing it from uh, a point where all the data is flowing into you and your your ability to actually access that data and make sense out of it will give you a unique point of view so why don't you tell us what is working what's not working where do we need to focus uh sure so uh, thank you mr sishadri and uh, thank you asu cham for giving me this opportunity uh, i think the question you have posed is is uh, much larger than uh, our current remit but i would step back and uh, basically look at uh, what has happened in our country in the last 4 months it's a complete black swan event uh, i think it takes me back uh, 12 years when uh, i was on deputation to sebi in 2008 and i mean i was there till 2013 and we held uh, handled the uh, global financial uh, uh, crisis now let's look at really what's what's happening in terms of activity i think you made an important point that you know who is active in the financial market is that an indicator of what's happening in the financial markets we saw a fall back if i were to just take the indices there's probably a fall back of about uh, you know 30 odd percent in the indices from uh, the pre covid uh, levels if i were to just make a simple comparison with the indices in 2008 uh, we saw a near, nearly 60% uh, panic reaction and then of course the recovery was slow it's amazing how the markets have uh, recovered after the initial fall in in march now is that an indication enough of what's happening in our economy probably uh, one input into you know an indicator of what is a revival and what is resilience so i think the point really is about resilience and where is that resilience coming from uh, of course everyone has correctly stated that the government has stepped in i think the rbi has been incredibly proactive going back uh, to the uh, gfc the crisis there was again met by a very proactive step with rbi stepping in and providing a, le a lender of last resort to the mutual funds so we we have uh, the larger uh, machinery within the financial sector which is obviously playing its part we are also i think seeing a fairly robust growth in terms of relative terms in the agricultural sector and again of course this is all information that's there in the pink papers it is something which is a silver lining in this dark hour and maybe we will see the revival of the fmcg sector the two wheeler sector so there are you know probably uh, small islands of growth amongst this larger crisis the infrastructure area is the other one which i think is a very important one it's the constant supply of electricity is something that this country has not seen we probably are a step closer to uh, you know such uh, basic support to industry as far as the uh, banking sector is concerned in fact nesl 
has a remit under the IBC to hold financial contracts for across the country. And we're not talking about only the regulated part of the country, but we're also talking about intercorporate advances and even lending by money lenders, which also is to be, uh, they're obligated to file information in the information utility. Uh, I can give you a macro level analysis. We are in fact um, in the stage of doing a lot more data mining at a macro level. We obviously cannot look at the micro level granular information because that is what is happening between uh, two parties is not something that we are privy to. But I think everyone's more interested in the macro level data. So I don't think our lending has even reached GDP proportions. So we are still probably lower than GDP when it comes to the total lending that is recorded in this country. As NESL, we have recorded 85 lakh crores of outstanding borrowings from the corporate sector from across the banking, NBFC, and what I would call the capital market sector. So we have a, a sizable amount of a borrowing that's happening on the markets. This is privately placed debentures as well as what is listed. The banking sector itself contributes to, I think, about 45 lakh crores of lending to the corporate sector. The NBFCs would have a smaller share. And therefore, we are looking at many more players in the market. And that is really what has surprised us in our initial analysis, that the kind of uh, lending that is happening within the country across regulated entities and non-regulated entities is reasonably large and i'm talking corporate borrowings with uh, insurance companies and a few mutual funds yet to uh, file their debentures and bonds in which they have invested so we are still not uh, you know completely done with the filing of information and the information utility we are looking at about 110 lakh crore of lending by various organized lenders to the corporate sector which is uh, you know not a small figure at all and i think in terms of comparison with uh, you know other countries it's probably unfair to compare ourselves with developed countries but we still have a long way to go in terms of increasing that lending whereby you know the the gross total of lending in the country somewhere comes close to what gdp figures are and that is really where many of the developed countries are probably standing and even more so the, the initial reaction to the point that are we sort of reviving well, what's happened has happened. I think we're certainly seeing extremely positive steps uh, in terms of revival. Uh, I know it from, uh, you know, sort of the uh, inside circles within the uh, government that the kind of stress that is being put on infrastructure is not small. And I think going back to just purely Keynesian economics, the kind of uh, you know growth that we can probably see from spending in infrastructure would have a multiplier effect and of course housing would be a very large component of that so from 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 uh, you know the initial reactions yes we need to concentrate that much more in helping the lending happening and i will come to more of that as we take uh, questions in the second round thanks Thank you very much, Mr. Raman. Very, very uh, uh, insightful. Uh, as you rightly said, every monetarist becomes a Keynesian uh, when a crisis happens. So I think the best of us have become Keynesians now. Um, now, I, I think, uh, uh, as you rightly said, there is uh, we are a resilient economy and resilience is showing through. But let's move to the second step. I, I, I trust uh, Mr. Bell's uh, audio problems are now resolved let um, and you know i'd request mr bell to actually talk about what is happening currently and what he thinks the banks can do or the financial system as such can do i mean banks are only a, a small component of the total financial system what can the financial system do to a generate uh, demand and b to ensure that the supply side problems are resolved mr bell sure uh, am i audible now Yes, you are. Great. So um, as to what the financial system 
can can do uh, let me just, just start off with a little bit of your first question uh, also getting answered there um, whether it's a demand side or a supply side and hence how it can be sorted <clears throat> i think the problem began much before the uh, the pandemic really hit and the problems were showing up on the demand side weakening while the supply side uh, was was not looking too bad people were able to borrow much more uh, easily uh, i think pandemic changed that completely overnight and it became suddenly a supply side or a liability uh, side issue where availability of funds became very difficult so while the demand was already weakening now the financial sectors um, especially the nbfcs started struggling with the liability side issues and liquidity issues to be more uh, precise now that's something which you were not ready to handle because you've never seen that in the past uh, uh, in our financial sector right? so you're not uh, adequately equipped to handle that shock that came overnight and that's where the schemes by the government and rbi help uh, and uh, whether it's tltro or pcg or the various other uh, you know push that came from the government to the banks to start lending uh, has helped ease out that liquidity and the liability side issue to a large extent uh, but as i think some of the other panelists also talked about it's still driven by uh, support measures from the sovereign it's it's not a risk appetite that's back uh, in the financial sector to on its own uh, drive the economy because financial sector uh, ultimately has to be the lubricant uh, in the economy for it to function well that risk appetite is not yet back uh, in the uh, financial sector and it's only there because there is a support that's available from rbi government of india whatever you call it the sovereign support is there and that's why this risk appetite is there risk appetite otherwise is not there again back to a bigger demand side issue now because uh, now the 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 uh, ability of the financial sector to see if the asset side challenges are going to be much bigger and how much bigger we all i think understand that npas are going to rise uh, to what extent they are going to rise that uncertainty is so large um, and typically how does one come out of a slowdown you come out of a slowdown through a demand side uh, impetus uh, that impetus can come through infrastructure spending or it can come through easing of interest rates that uh, invites companies and individuals to borrow more and spend more um, unfortunately while the interest rates have been cut it hasn't given the confidence to the economy to borrow more uh, and start spending now whatever borrowing that's happening uh, and we we heard uh, i think nipa nipa mentioned about uh, cps being raised at 3 3 and a half uh, 4% all of that borrowing is happening to build cushions it's not happening to spend right uh, and till you're only building cushions you're not going to restart the economy you need to restart the economy by spending that uh, borrowing or any in investment either equity or borrowing that's coming in um we've we've seen uh, the 3 lakh crore that's been announced for smes uh, which is guaranteed by the government and the banks have gone into an overdrive to sanction uh, i believe till some time back uh, around 1.2 1.3 lakh crores have been sanctioned but only less than half of it has been availed by smes the reason is again while they are taking sanctions they don't want to take that money because they don't know what to do with it there is no demand there is no demand uh, so they they don't want to produce they don't want to use up debt if they if they start borrowing they need to start deploying it and the demand is absent so i think more needs to be done to push that demand it was required uh, more than a year back also and i think a lot of us were talking about that the government needs to do more to stimulate demand real estate is a good area to try and stimulate demand there because that has a multiplier impact on others infrastructure is the other area um, these measures were required then they are required today also uh, to push that demand and then the confidence in individuals to start spending today a lot of people 
uh, still having jobs, still earning as they were earning earlier, but they are not spending because that confidence to spend is uh, missing. So that needs to come back. Uh, till that doesn't happen, really, financial sector doesn't have much that it can do. You can keep cutting the interest rates to whatever level. That's all that a financial sector uh, can really do. Uh, you can uh, do a bit of opening, uh, solve the logistic issues and where the money should go and so on. But if the confidence is not there, that's not going to happen. So uh, the first thing is the demand and the confidence that needs to come back so that people will start spending. seem to have lost uh, Mr. Bell midstream. Mr. Bell? Yeah, uh, am I audible? Yeah, you're audible now, yeah. Okay, um, so the, the, uh, the, yeah, the, the final point that I was making is the primary issuances are back to the levels that we saw before the pandemic. So January, February, we've been tracking month on month the primary issuances. And uh, after February, for NBFCs, they had just fallen off uh, to one sixth of what they were. So I think more than 30,000 crores per month used to be the borrowing by NBFCs. That fell to about five, 6,000 crore in March. Uh, they simply were not getting money. And the only ones who were still getting money were the AAA and the uh, PSU, uh, the financial sector players. Uh, that seems to have changed a bit now in May and June. The uh, volumes have picked up dramatically even for NBFCs. But these are in uh, borrowings still in the double A category, not much below that. Uh, and these are <clears throat> borrowings from banks. So it's banks who are investing in these bonds, whether TLTRO uh, uh, or LTRO or whatever the banks are investing in these bonds. Nobody else is coming uh, forward. Obviously, they have their own constraints, mutual funds, pension funds, insurance companies, they have their own constraints. But uh, banks have that limitation. How long will they keep uh, buying this? debt with the, and that too if the government support is not there so a lot of this has to change and that change can only happen through a demand side stimulus which is still not come and we're all waiting for that and uh, hopefully it will not be a moratorium another moratorium to give this support but it will be a demand side stimulus uh, instead which can then kickstart the economy which runs on its own Thank you, Mr. Bell. Uh, again, not a particularly positive message. Uh, you're saying that the situation continues to be grim. You're saying that people are not spending as much as they should. You heard to the paradox of thrift. And um, so if nobody is spending, there is no demand and there is therefore um, likelihood that the activity will not pick up. And you talked about how the government now needs to, or if not the government, we need to figure out how to get demand back up again so that uh, you know businesses can start cranking out uh, widgets that can be sold and then the whole cycle uh, can, can actually uh, get completed. Uh, very true, the only problem, and as a, as a banker I see, is that you know banks uh, are also operating in the same environment. And they are, at the end of the day, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their depositors and therefore they need to protect the depositors' money. It is not the bank's money, it is the depositors' money. And if they don't have visibility to the future, very difficult for people to make them take risk. I think the, uh, the sovereign has done a wonderful job by you know, making 33 lakh crores available where they are taking the full risk. Maybe a little bit more risk has to be taken at the at the sovereign level to get the economy cranked up again. And maybe, you know, the guarantees that we've offered to MSMEs need to be broadened a little bit so that, uh, you know, more uh, people can actually benefit uh, uh, from that uh, from that lending. So let me uh, request uh, Mr. Nath now to give us his views on what can the financial system do to turbocharge growth? Yeah. Very difficult uh, question to answer. As Rajat was saying that uh, there is a limited maneuverability which financial system have on its own. Uh, and obviously there has to be a demand side revival. Uh, but, you know, being a player into the SME and micro SME segment wherein we connect on the both side, the large banks, 
you know, we have been uh, beneficiary of some of this, uh, given that unlevered balance sheet we had. So we got a lot of liquidity because of that. But if you look at, uh, I think so. They, for, you know, I will divide this into two things. One, whatever existing things which the sovereign or the government has done, uh, and what is the mindset there have been, and what should be done going forward. One of the things which you will see that uh, the government and the central bank was in an overdrive mode to protect the financial stability uh, of the financial system as a whole, right? So majority of the schemes which came in, except the emergency credit line, which is the uh, new credit to, to underlying SME borrowers, uh, majority of the scheme is towards providing liquidity to avoid defaults and mismatches. Uh, but, uh, but none of those schemes were designed for extending liquidity to then further extend it to the underlying borrower segment even if whatever is the existing demand right and i'll give you an example if you look at partial credit guarantee scheme the partial credit guarantee scheme the maximum which an nbfc can get into that is 20 percent or 25 percent of your fy19 asset book or maximum 1.25 time or your next six months of maturing liability which means that when it was designed it was designed to protect the next six months of default even the you know SBI SPV which has uh, which has been created is again as a three month uh, you know protect three months of default scenario. Even in a simpler fix, for example, in emergency credit line, if you look at uh, it is uh, if a large portion of SME and micro SME segment in India is serviced by a very small sub segment of NBFCs. In our rough estimate, roughly around a million uh, odd. Uh, you know, uh, in, in, in informal segment of micro SMEs are serviced by the smaller plethora of 100 plus NBFCs who even if they want to extend credit, they cannot because there is no liquidity available to them, right? So emergency credit line is, is beneficial for the lending institution who have the liquidity. A simple fix of saying that a large bank, if it extend a term loan to a small NBFC where the money is being used only for dissemination of credit under emergency credit line, that term loan also is covered under the emergency guarantee scheme and there is a sovereign backing so it doesn't change any mathematics right so because finally the money is getting disintermediated through a small nbfc would have extended this credit dissemination in a big way so i think so first and foremost in within the existing framework how do you allow uh, you know money to now start flowing for fresh credit versus only protecting default because I think the financial system stability to a large extent has come uh, you know, to a reasonable uh, comfort zone. That is first one. Second, uh, uh, which I say is that you know, the government has to go beyond financial system and has to start believing that, that just by extension or providence of liquidity would not revive economy as a whole. There is sustainable measures. Uh, and in that, I would say that one other thing which you know obviously like any in any democratic countries government stay away from providing support to large corporates but we have to also realize that these large corporate corporates are also drivers of economy and if you don't provide systematic support to them then the revival of economy is difficult right so if the large travel industry is in a shutdown mode and it you know people are losing employment airline industry people are losing employment all of that has cascading effect right because when People are, you know, worried about their job losses, suffering. They will not go buy homes. Consumer demand would, won't come up. So there is to be, a, while providing, you know, liquidity and support to MSME, but there has to be more systematic measures to look at the large component of big industries and how you provide support to them uh, in some form and structure, uh, wherein, you know, that, that also start happening. It can be in form of, you know, paycheck protection program like in US. You know, not people. I'm seeing large number of corporates are leaving their, you know, commercial rental space. So that is a new bubble which is getting built up in terms of, you know, un, uh, you know, vacant inventory and so on and so forth. So first, I would say that existing scheme, you know, there has to be now retweaking to be done in terms of not just looking the survival and the financial uh, stability, but extension of credit and the demand side support to be provided to large mid corporates directly by the sovereign, which will start reviving the economy. Shanath, we, did you complete or, I, yes, or did I, we lose I, you? No, I did complete. Oh, Thank you very much. I think that was a very, uh, uh, very interesting comments you make. Basically, you're saying 
think that more supreme support is required in some form or the other either the tailor the retailoring of the existing offering in such a fashion that intermediaries who are providing credit to the msmes uh, are also given access to this funding so that they can then go and onward lend to these msmes that are starving of credit i think that's a point that we will we will take note of and we will see how we can communicate uh, with the government and request them to take a look at this um let me request uh, nipa now to give us a view on what she thinks the i you know the banking system and the bond market can do uh, to make credit more easily accessible and restart the economy uh, see we we've, we've had uh, the pre covid uh, time uh, where we've seen a lot of credit events uh, in the economy and hence the credit appetite in general has been extremely low which of course uh, with the uh, kind of money push which has happened and the uh, role which psu banks have uh, played we have seen a good amount of good credit being uh, taken away but as i understand and if we are i agree with mr bahal that all of this is just ensuring there is a liquidity buffer for all the corporates for stability and this is not growth this is not something even nbfc what they are borrowing is for meeting their requirement and not necessarily for the fresh uh, uh, amount of lending and i think for the kick start the kind of confidence rbi and government has given in terms of ensuring that is a stability i think for kick starting you would require a push which essentially does have some amount of support which does come from uh, the regulators and unless that happens the impact is so wide because as he mentioned that there would be industries where there would be huge job loss having an impact probably on a retail book and across and hence uh, you know unless we ensure that there are targeted help which gets into those segments it will be very difficult for uh, ensuring that the financial sector is ready to take some of those risk so uh, i i believe that support will require for at least 18 months to 24 months because we are still not out of the impact we are still not out of the lockdown to see what is the kind of impact we have and even if people do restart we are maybe at 50 to 60% any corporates to be profitable which is below 80% is going to be extremely difficult so uh, either the uh, support till the time the equity infusion comes in a slightly smaller entities we have seen buoyant equity market around the world and in india so at least the large corporates will be able to take care of themselves with that but i think the rest of it will require a lot of hand holding over the next 6 months to 1 year so as we have had schemes of stability i think the scheme of growth will have to be uh, uh, you know calibrated and put down and at the same time i think uh, similar liquidity situation where there is an ample of liquidity to ensure that there is a risk appetite will continue to be there of course which is very visible in uh, you know the curve being very steep that at least 6 uh, months to 9 months or 1 year people will see this kind of liquidity in the system thank you thank you uh, nipa uh, i guess uh, one of the issues that we are going to have to deal with is the fact that private enterprises if they require state support uh it will be viewed you know like it was during the global financial crisis that you know profits are private whereas uh, losses are socialized uh and that is a problem for any any government to deal with but under the circumstances i guess if the economy has to has to start again and has to you know have the momentum that is required then perhaps uh, to a degree these things will have to be uh um, tolerated and will have to be done very consciously in such a fa- and we'll have to come up with a mechanism by which the government can be compensated for taking the risk um and i don't know how to do that that is a subject of a different conversation but perhaps we can ask mr raman who is a government representative on this panel uh in his prior uh, avatar to tell us what he thinks and what we should be doing uh <clears throat> thank you again so uh, let me uh, strike an extremely optimistic note uh it's been in the works for a while so it's not something completely new but what i'm really spelling out before uh, this audience is the fact that there has been a lot of thought regarding how to make the credit industry work more efficiently 
the information utility has been a piece that is not so talked about as part of the IBC uh, legal framework. The information utility is now completely ready to play its role. And therefore, about uh, four or five months ago, in fact, pre-COVID, RBI had addressed all the banks and NBFCs that the information lying in the information utility being the widest and the largest scope as a single entity across the country. It's wider than the acrylic data and much more than what is available uh, in any other uh, you know, credit uh, repository, if I may call it by that name. Uh, therefore, for credit monitoring purpose, the banks and NBFCs should use the information lying in the information utility. This has already been done. We have uh, taken this forward with the largest banks in the country, and there are APIs now being, uh, you know, sort of uh, communicated between each other. So the banks would be able to consume the information from the IU on a like as a stream of uh, you know information or data packets, which will then go into the algorithm created by banks for the purpose of better lending. So what am I saying? Basically, the information asymmetry, which has been a bane of uh, every credit industry across the world, has got that much uh, smaller and narrower. We probably are at a point when we could say that between financial creditors and operational creditors, there is a lot of information that is available with regard to a particular corporate debtor. And when I say corporate debtor, it is anybody in business. It could be a partnership, a proprietorship, but for corporates, the data is near complete. And that is the point I had made earlier. So what we really would like is that all creditors, in fact, we've even spoken to uh, an interesting uh, and, and very avant-garde group called the Digital Lenders Association, which is a set of fintechs which are you know putting uh, together the peer to peer platform we are really trying our best to spread the awareness of the fact that every financial creditor has got access of course based on certain rules which uh, will which are there as part of the IBBI regulations but the access to data is now at your fingertip in literal terms so whether it is coming to the uh, IU portal and logging in and taking data of one particular debtor PAN and our system runs on the basis of PAN or whether it is a large in, uh, entity like a bank which runs uh, you know, complete integration through APIs where they pull data on a continuous basis. So that is really the first point which I would like to make loud and clear. And the second point which is, you know, uh, don't want to really sound too dramatic about it, but this is something which the government of India has now taken forward as a way of dematerialization of loan contracts. And very recently, it's just been about uh, two weeks since the Department of Revenue in the government of India has issued, uh, I mean, they are, they are in a sense a request, but directions to the state governments to allow for digital e-stamping. And as all of you in the credit industry would know, one of the pain points of concluding a loan is the documentation. There is a certain amount of cost and that cost is better known to you, but that cost is not a small amount of money. It is also a lot of time wasted for getting the uh, contract to be completed on digit on on a on a stamp paper the word e stamping is itself a misnomer as on date because everybody still has to get a printout of the stamp paper so it is it is very odd so we have now come up with what is called digital e stamping it's it's a bit of an oxymoron but nevertheless the fact is that we have now got a fully digital process which takes all of five minutes for completion of a loan documentation. This is completely based on APIs and all the banks, in fact, the six largest banks in the country, both private sector and public sector are currently integrating their systems with the NESL information utility. Union Bank of India has gone ahead and done a pilot in Rajasthan and Delhi because Rajasthan and Delhi are the two states which have already allowed for digital e-stamping to take place and digital e-stamping is nothing but 
issuance of a stamp certificate based on the payment of stamp duty obviously everything is entirely online so really what we're trying to plug is the supply side ease the ease of doing business the ease of doing banking and that's really how we've taken it forward the iba is completely uh, in in sync with this uh, all the government departments that are needed have provided the support and now because for loan agreements it is a state subject so the state governments have to pass that final order for allowing digital e stamping to take for to go forth in their particular state if it were a central subject that would have probably happened by now but being a state subject the articles for banking and there are roughly about 15 odd articles that typically the bankers use from from a loan agreement to a bank guarantee to a hypothecation mortgage whatever it may be and therefore these particular articles have to be expressly <coughs> permitted by the respective state governments now this entire platform has come to creation with a uh, stockholding corporation which has which is the uh, what is known as a cra that is the um it, it's it's a common uh, it's a it's a, what is it an accounting uh, uh, tie up that the state governments have done with stockholding corporation for the purpose of stamp duty so stockholding has shared its platform with nesl so we've got a complete integration with stockholding which goes across 22 states of course there are a few states outside it where we are doing a direct integration with those states but suffice it to say that we are really talking about in the next two or three months a sea change in the ease of doing documentation and this really came up in uh, you know in sort of sharp relief when the fm had a meeting with the heads of the public sector banks and the bankers themselves brought this point up and I think the government has reacted with an amazing, uh, you know, speed, where the Department of Revenue, Revenue now has given a directive to the state that digital e-stamping on the NESL platform is a valid form of payment of stamp duty and issuance of stamp certificate. So what we're really doing is we've uh, got what is uh, what is ready in terms of the infrastructure for creating a digital contract repository. And that going forward will have enormous you know, benefits for uh, buying and selling of loans. So the RBI has already understood this in their Manoharan Committee report. And they have looked at the information utility as being a central contract registry. The other uh, large point which uh, has happened is the uh, carrying forward of the recommendations of the UK Sina Committee report. And the MSME Ministry has worked very closely with the information utility. Therefore, the MSMEs of this country have a huge support in using the information utility for expediting the payment of unpaid dues to the MSME industry and the MSMEs. Uh, believe me, I think their biggest problem is not, uh, you know, getting bank uh, lending. It's about recovering their money in terms of their commercial transactions. So we have an integration with the msme ministry whereby msmes if they put their data into the msme ministry on the samadhan platform automatically it comes into the information utility and it goes forward in terms of a demand notice and a default broadcast so what information utility really does at the end of the day every default is translated into a default broadcast which goes across all financial creditors and operational creditors that may have a exposure to that particular defaulting entity so, you know, I just wanted to lay the framework out, uh, you know, in, in a macro sense. Uh, we are working very closely with the largest of banks. We're very closely working with the NBFC sector. There's, a, in fact, if you ask me, the vibrancy of the NBFC sector in terms of adopting technology is, you know, sort of uh, probably a step ahead of even some of the large banks. So, sh short point is that from a uh, government stroke regulatory perspective i think the the maximum attempts are being made to help the uh, industry revive and of course all this digital uh, you know intervention in terms of uh, uh, documentation basically falls in line with the entire concept of working only from a remote basis so where we are sitting currently we can actually go on to the nesl platform complete our documentation 
and five minutes, we don't have to move out of the comfort of our homes and offices. So I think we're all working in the right direction. And I'm sure, uh, you know, with the kind of, uh, you know, push that we're getting from the uh, government and the banking sector, it should certainly go ahead and, and we'll probably see a very different, uh, you know, ease of doing business and within the credit industry, at least. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ravan. Very uh, enlightening. If, I mean, if uh, contract enforceability improves, I think from a lender's perspective, that is going to be a very big uh, positive and risk taking from a banker's perspective will increase. Uh, it's one of the issues that we have as a, as a nation is that contract enforceability is questionable and uh, it does take very long. I mean, we are all there. I still remember the first legal opinion I got from Mr. Nani Palkiwala. Uh, the first line of that legal opinion, we were asking him whether securitization transactions were legal in this country. And this was in the early 1990s. And uh, the first line of his opinion said, the Indian legal system makes eternity intelligible. So, I mean, anything that you can do to, to, to make it quicker will ensure credit flow uh, happen uh, more quickly. Uh, we uh, just an announcement, uh, Mr. Ra Rajeshwar Rao, who is an eminent uh, uh, ED at the uh, Reserve Bank of India, will be joining us at about in about 10 minutes time, we think. Uh, but before we go there, a couple of uh, housekeeping requests. One is if you could think of, um, uh, you know, uh, requests that we could make uh, to, to both the RBI as well as the government uh, with respect to changes in policy uh, that we can put before uh, the next monetary policy committee would be very helpful. Uh, and uh, any any specific questions that you may have that we can ask the um, uh, we can ask Mr. Rajeshwar Rao will also be very helpful. So with that, let me turn uh, now to Mr. Agarwal, who is part of industry and he knows uh, you know what uh, what the issues are uh, with respect to the industry itself and what, in his point of view, should the banking system be doing. Uh, you know, to, to ease uh, business and in these times. Mr. Agarwal? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you again. Uh, I think, uh, again, uh, if NBFC is to be fully financed, like uh, they should start uh, lending to other sector, that will be great help. And totally, uh, nowadays, all industry, MSME, are depending upon bank. So their dependency should be reduced because if vibrant bond market will be there, I think money can be raised through that bond market. So uh, that has to be developed in, uh, in a greater strength. And for that, uh, uh, like uh, EPFO and all other uh, insurance companies, they are supposed to, they are going to take only uh, AAA bond, not uh, dealing with double uh, a a rating and investment grade bond so that has to that has to be changed and it has to be uh, made systematic so that bond market can be drive and banks should be active in bond market and uh, it's a good news that uh, this in june uh, those are 20 india trade surplus was in positive so uh, it has happened after 2002 so uh, though uh, imports has been reduced a lot and export are uh, reduced, but it's not a very happy situation. But uh, we must uh, understand if government is focusing Atam Nirbhar Bharat, that means uh, make in India, and it's a great opportunity when China, uh, when people are not liking, when go uh, other governments are not liking China and they want to change their manufacturing base. So India should provide uh, that uh, gap and uh, proactively they should do their ease of doing business as mr s raman said that uh, uh, contract enforceability small small things we have to and uh, do uh, rectify and so that if any industry has to be set up it can be set up in one month or two months it should not take longer time so all these provisions and uh, we have to relax our uh, uh, regulatory a little bit make it practical we, uh, bureaucratic hurdles should not be there so in this covid time 
uh, we have to be extraordinary we have uh, government should take extraordinary steps they have to start their projects they have to spend on infrastructures and they sup should support industry those who are putting in fresh money and, uh, and the state government is also support for land acquisition and labor laws to be simplified so all these things required to uh, uh, rectify the situation and uh, i think a total ecosystem has to be improved so that's all i am saying thank you very much thank you mr agarwal very very uh, uh, insightful comments i think uh, i'll now take the opportunity to thank uh, the the panelists here they've uh, really provided a lot of wonderful insight basically two or three key messages that are coming out of this meeting are a that the government is doing a, a whole lot to to ease, ease the situation uh, they have made liquidity available they have made the credit guarantees available they are also working on improving the ease of doing business through the automation and digitalization of various parts of our ecosystem but these are all positive aspects of what the government is doing and it continues to be extremely responsive um the the request from industry seems to be that in addition to what it has done it probably has to do a little bit more because without sovereign support lending channels will perhaps not get unclogged today and the ability of private lenders to take risk uh and in the environment that we are operating in today is perhaps limited and therefore there needs to be discussion with the government to understand in what fashion uh, you know uh, they would be in a position to help uh, the banking and the financial system as such uh, take incremental risk um i think those were the two large points that have come out uh, basically there is ample liquidity liquidity is not an issue the bond markets have revived there is more activity but the activity is limited to a certain set of customers who are finding it relatively easy to access the market those who can access the market are accessing it at rates which are significantly lower than what they were accessing maybe 3 or 4 months ago so it is a it is like a two stage market one for certain type of customers the market is very liquid and very well priced and for another set of customers the market is very very difficult to access and perhaps not priced as well either uh, therefore uh, and i you know please do chime in and correct me if i'm not summarizing this right there is the need to broad base access to uh, to funding and that can only happen through appropriate risk sharing mechanisms because the banking system may or may not be in a position to take all the risk at this point in time uh, am i paraphrasing this right uh, gentlemen and uh, lady i can't hear anything yes for oh, sorry. sure sorry <laughs> huh? okay so uh, sorry i said it's very precise summarization mr shadri oh thank you uh so while we wait for uh, mr rajeshwar rao maybe if we could just uh, spend a couple of minutes thinking through you know some requests that we can make both to rbi and to the government uh if we could articulate those that we could uh, you know put them together and then uh, hand them over to the appropriate body uh, you want us to explain now i have few suggestion as far as nbfc as a sector is concerned yes please so uh, one of the thing mr shishadri is my view is that future of uh, you know the dif the demarcation between the banks and the nbfc in last decade it got blurred uh, pre ilfs because there were large number of nbfc which were you know acting and behaving like as if they had so much of funding available to them they they that they aspired to become competitor to banks or become banks itself uh and actually that's not true the whole fundamental premise on which M nbfcs exist is to provide credit or access to, uh, that market which otherwise banks are not servicing right 
but if you both of them are in the same segment of the market then you know why you have to have these two two architecture so my uh, personal view is that the next decade would be of of creating a, an infrastructure or an architecture of deep collaboration between the banks and the nbfcs where banks have access to liquidity and liability side uh, but also they serve the much bigger and broader market where, where an nbfc has to serve the micro sme the sme some nbfcs for consumer mortgage businesses and the co lending to that extent was a step in right direction but you know because you know uh, it has not taken uh, any shape while there are a large number of uh, you know partnership which has been signed and announced and one of the fundamental reason which i think so is that when a bank lend to an nbfc it, it predominantly relies upon nbfc's inherent capital strength and that risk buffer which that provide but when a bank has to lend as a co lender uh, it doesn't get the benefit of that you know risk buffer while nbfc technically is getting all the commercial benefit of that so and once that once you are in that spectrum banks start enforcing their own risk parameter to underwrite the customer and then it's a non starter and that's what we have seen in the entire co lending spectrum so if rbi could allow uh, credit enhancement or you know some kind of first loss cover uh, under the co-lending arrangement, we can see a large number of uh, banks, public sector and private sector, would then rely upon NBFCs underwriting and start co-lending with them. So then NBFC, without under the pressure of borrowing on their balance sheet, can actually extend credit in a big way, uh, is my belief. I think that's a very valid. So basically, you are saying that uh, the contractual decisions that banks are taking with nbfcs and the form of that contractual decision should be left to the lending institutions as opposed to being uh, rule bound and dictated by a particular policy of the government or the yeah. policy of the rbi yeah absolutely uh, so if you, if you look at it in that form then you can you can actually have first loss guarantees etc cetera, etc cetera, where the bank can get benefits of the capital push that the NBFC actually NBFC. has, right? Yes, sir. Understand that with that we will put as a required request. And Mr. Bell, any any comments from you? Anything that we should request? Yeah, I think uh, one area. See, over the years we've been talking about uh, reducing our dependence on banks and moving to the capital market and what can be done. Uh, whatever little had happened, I think we have fallen many steps behind again uh, under this crisis. Um, I think it's it's time that RBI stops looking at those small steps incrementally to try and promote the capital market. But it uh, whether it is RBI or uh, SEBI or the government, I think we need bigger steps coming in uh, to make this market more vibrant. Um, otherwise, uh, I, I think we will keep falling back and looking on banks and then all that issue of public money getting used to support banks and who takes the hit and uh, these things will keep coming back, cropping back and, and we also heard, I think the, uh, one of the panelists was talking about the debt uh, compared to the GDP, we still very low, the lending is still very less and all of that is leading to the same thing that we don't have a good capital market and whatever little is there is in the form of equities which is risky and so uh, the debt market needs to pick up so whether it's credit default swaps on single names uh, which act as credit insurance and larger players being allowed to provide that or it is in the form uh, um, of repos of the corporate bonds being allowed by again a larger set of players who can keep it as liquidity and use it when required and repos not just of the AAA and GSEC securities but let give more preference to using repos of A rated securities so that there is more market in the A rated securities and uh, we are not the, the borrowers also are not forced to somehow structure their business models to get to a AAA rating. Uh, I don't think that's an optimal way of running a business of trying to get to a AAA rating. So it, the optimal way is that whatever rating that you are uh, at, you borrow at a certain cost and there is money available 
uh, at that rating at the right uh, cost and that can be a better optimal business model rather than everybody trying to get to a triple a which doesn't happen and there have been a lot of forums where people have talked of why india has so many triple a's compared to us having lesser triple a's and, and so on i think it's it's the business model that a double a rated or an a rated or a triple b rated or even a speculative junk rated company out there can get money uh, at any time at a certain price which is impossible in our market so uh, it, it pushes companies in a certain direction which is not good so i think more lot needs to be done in bigger steps from there i've joined in i think uh, uh, okay, mr rao hello. is that you yeah 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 uh, mr rao your uh, video is not uh, we are not able to see you can you turn on your I don't video know. Uh, can you see me now uh, showing green yeah uh, yes it is uh, we can yes. see something but uh, it Hello, is can actually, you hear me? Camera is I, on the reverse side. You, your camera is, I think, huh? pointing somewhere else. You can't see. We can, your camera is uh, uh, from the camera is visible. Camera, sir. Your uh, back camera uh, is visible uh, right now. Uh, but actually, anyway, because I was just on a, another webinar, it was looking okay. So I'm not sure how it's. Uh, Visible sir, you not. have to I, you, in the camera. You have to actually it, make it front facing. At the moment, the camera is taking the back side of your screen. Oh, 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 oh. So now it's gone. One minute, it's gone. Huh? Now it's back. Huh? I know. I think uh, technology challenge. Anyway, yeah, I think that's a problem. Huh? Okay. Um, no, the camera is showing okay, but I'm not sure whether. Uh, uh, anu, can, anu, can you help? Help, sir. Anu. Sir, we make a call, sir. Give oh, me a minute. Just one minute. Uh, one minute. Well, I think. See, uh, it's showing that I'm sharing. Of, uh, yeah. Huh? You're not able Hello. to see you, Mr. Yeah. Rao, but maybe maybe now that you've joined us, maybe now that you've joined us, yeah. we can continue on audio till uh, such time as we find a solution for this, sir. So we have yeah, a yeah. large number of people who are waiting to uh, uh, to hear you. So thank you very much for taking the time to be here. It is a very important subject that we spent the last uh, two, two hours and a bit discussing, which is, you know, how can... Uh, the last discussion was on how the banking system can actually help restart uh, e the economy, and the prior discussion was uh, on uh, more on you know how can financial resources be appropriately used so that economic growth can be enhanced. Um, hmm. So we were waiting to to hear from you, uh, you know, your point of view on what is happening in the economy and. Uh, uh, what uh, the government and RBI are doing, and what what is your expectation of the banking system and the financial services system in general uh, to aid uh, you know the renewal of our uh, economic uh, system? So with that, let me thank you once again for taking the time to join us and uh, turn this over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Yusha. I don't know. Mm. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for this invite and uh, I think this is the third occasion where I've joined one of the SOCM events in Mumbai in the last four to five years and while my association was physical in the last previous years this time the ambience and the context are quite different and the circumstances are of course infinitely more challenging for all of us. The pandemic has actually wrought dramatic changes in the economic scenario and uh, going forward it may not be business as usual. The challenge for the policymakers and authorities at this juncture is essentially threefold. One is to address the health issues immediately. Second would be to develop financial and economic measures to support the vulnerable and maintain conditions for a strong recovery. And finally, enable policies which would help us to return to growth once the containment measures are lifted. In this context, the theme on which uh, I have been asked to talk, that is the role of financial institutions to restart the economy, is crucial. But here again, let me just uh, start off by saying that uh, in terms of crises, 
the central banks are always the defenders of the first resort in such a crisis and therefore we need to dwell more than a little on the role of reserve bank to support the financial markets and the financial institutions and this is what i propose to do the covid pandemic has act induced extreme uncertainty in the financial markets inflicted a high human and economic cost and uh, and has caused unparalleled de demand destruction as the countries con across the globe closed down their borders introduced lockdowns and implemented social distancing norms large swaths of the various economies became dysfunctional the imf in its april 20 uh, world economic outlook rightly termed the current crisis as the great lockdown indian financial markets through to witness volatility of high magnitude and several entities faced stress in terms of loss of access to and higher cost of funding amid disruption of cash flows and working capital cycles the financial system needed to deal with these issues besides the fallout of the lockdown on the real economy okay one in order to address these challenges the reserve bank has been quite proactive and has deployed several conventional and unconventional tools to restore orderly conditions in the financial markets the first step of the reserve bank was slated to ensure that the financial markets and the institutions continued to function normally and the payment systems and banking services were running uninterrupted in the face of dislocations and workplace disruptions later the reserve bank adopted a multi pronged approach to one expand liquidity in the system sizeably to ensure that the financial markets and institutions are able to function normally second reinforce monetary transmission so that the bank credit flows on easier terms are sustained to all those who have been affected by the pandemic third ease financial stress on individuals and companies by relaxing repayment pressures and improving work access to working capital and finally improving the functioning of markets in view of the high volatility experienced with the onset and the spread of the pandemic the monetary policy was already in an accommodation mode even before the onset of the covid-19 the system liquidity was also in surplus however after the onset of the covid-19 reserve bank acted with unprecedented promptness uh, by easing monetary policy through out of scheduled mpc meetings and by injecting sufficient liquidity into the banking system the policy repo rates which were lowered by 135 basis points between february and december 2019 was further reduced by an additional 115 basis points since march 2020 taking the cumulative rate cuts to about 250 basis points and at 4% i think the repo policy rate is at one of its lowest ever levels let me now briefly describe 10 specific measures taken by the reserve bank in the past 6 months to facilitate credit flow reinforce monetary transmission and ease pressures on the corporates and individuals first was the revised liquidity framework we introduced a revised liquidity management framework in february 20 based on the recommendations of an internal working group formed for this purpose the liquidity management framework was simplified by doing away and doing away with the targeted liquidity provisioning linked to the net demand and time liabilities and i'm sorry i'm not able to get that cam uh, camera so shall i continue as it is hello yes sir i think so mr shishadri requested that you should continue as hello. it is hello yeah hello uh, yeah hello hello yeah answer okay shall i continue sir sir bhi camera hang karo hang karo na help karo unko Uh, sir, uh, I think uh, man, maybe. Sir, you are using iPad. Let me see right? after I. Ah, uh, hello. Uh, sir, please go to the uh, security and privacy setting. Is it? Uh, There is a camera setting. I think that. No, I think the camera is showing on the reverse. That is the problem. So. Yes, sir. Uh, sir.
Can we just continue without the camera, uh, Mr. Singh, Dr. Singh? I mean, Perhaps, uh, let me see if after I deliver my points, perhaps if I can get the camera rolling again, it would be easier. Shall I continue, yeah, Mr. Sheshadri? Yeah. Yes, sir, please do continue, sir. Yeah, okay. So as I said, the liquidity management framework was simplified by doing away with the earlier proviso of targeted liquidity provision linked to a net demand and time liabilities of the banking system. And the financial system was assured of adequate liquidity at all times. Multiple operations of various tenors were replaced by one single fortnightly operation at the beginning of the reporting fortnight, followed by fine tuning operations every day, if and when required. The revised liquidity framework also introduced long term liquidity management instruments to manage durable liquidity. Subsequently, of course, once the COVID impact uh, started unraveling the economy, impacting the economy, we started off with the long term repo operations. So this was enabled to facilitate transmission of the monetary policy actions and also assuring the banks about the availability of durable liquidity at reasonable cost relative to the prevailing market conditions so as to augment the credit flows to the productive sectors. We conducted uh, long-term repos of one and three year tenors starting from February, 2020. Then in order to incentivize, incentivize the bank credit to specific productive sectors, we had uh, sustained uh, scheduled commercial banks were allowed to deduct the equivalent of their incremental credit dispersed by them as retail loans for automobiles residential housing and loans to micro and small and medium enterprises over and above the outstanding level of credit to these segments as at the end of the fortnight ending january 2020 from their net and demand and time liabilities for the maintenance of the cash reserve ratio external benchmarking for the new floating road loans and one-time restructuring scheme for msmes was another step after linking all the floating rate personal and retail loans and floating rate loans to micro and small enterprises to external benchmarks the pricing of loans by scheduled commercial banks for medium enterprises was also linked to the external benchmarks in april 2020 additionally to create an enabling environment for micro small and medium enterprise sector in the uh, in order to create an enabling environment uh, for the MSME sectors in its efforts towards increased formalization, a one-time restructuring without an asset classification downgrade to GST registered MSMEs was uh, allowed in, in January 2020. The targeted long-term repo operations was another uh, tool under, uh, launched by the Reserve Bank of India. The onset and the rapid propagation of COVID-19 led to extreme risk of sentiments in the financial markets and the liquidity premium on instruments such as corporate bonds, commercial paper and debentures surged. Combined with the thinning of trading activity with workplace disruptions, financial conditions for these instruments, which are used to access working capital limit in face of slowdown in bank credit also tightened. In order to mitigate their adverse effects to the economic activity leading to pressure on cash flows, Reserve Bank decided to conduct targeted long-term repo operations of up to three years tenor for a total amount of rupees one lakh crore. Liquidity availed under the targeted LTROs had to be deployed in investment grade corporate bonds, commercial paper and non-convertible bonds of both primary and secondary markets. Later, we also launched a targeted LTRO version 2, which was targeted to provide liquidity to the smaller NBFCs and MFIs. Another measure was the reduction in cash reserve ratio, keeping in view the asymmetric distribution of liquidity across the banking system and as a one-time measure to help the banks tide over the disruptions caused by the COVID-19. The CRR on all banks was reduced by 100 basis points to 3% of the NDTL with effect from the reporting fortnight beginning March 28, 2020. This reduction released primary liquidity of about rupees 1,37,000 crores uniformly across the banking system. Further taking cognizance of the hardships faced by the banks in terms of the social distancing of staff and consequent strains on reporting requirements, 
it was decided to reduce the minimum daily CRR balances maintained from 90% to 80% with effect from the first reporting fortnight beginning March 28, 2020. Banks were also allowed some relaxation in the, for the marginal standing facility for borrowing and uh, to provide comfort to the banking system, it was decided to increase the limit from 2% to 3% with immediate effect from March 28, 2020. There was a moratorium on term loans and deferment of interest on working capital facilities. All commercial banks, small finance banks and local area banks and uh, cooperative banks, AIFIs and NBFCs were permitted to allow a moratorium of three months on payment of installment in respect of term loans outstanding as on March, 20, March 1st, 2020. Further, in respect of working capital facilities, sanctioned in the form of cash or credit overdraft lending institutions were permitted to allow a deferment of three months on the payment of interest in all respect of all such facilities outstanding as on March 1st, 2020. Further on 17th April, 2020, it was decided that there would be an asset classification standstill for all accounts where moratorium were granted from March 1st, 2020 and this moratorium was further extended by three months to August 31st, 2020. Uh, of course, the, I also already alluded to the targeted LTRO version 2, which was to be given to the uh, mid-sized corporates as well as the MBFCs and smaller, as well as the microfinance institutions. The TLTRO was also supported with special refinance facilities to the extent of rupees 65,000 crores to the All India Financial Institutions. Uh, that is SIDBI, NABARD, NHB, as well as Exim Bank. Then in order to ease the financial stress, we also decided to extend certain regulatory measures, granting of the moratorium, deferment of interest for three months, easing of working capital finance, exemption from being classified as a defaulter in the supervisory reporting and reporting to the credit information companies, extension of resolution timelines for stressed assets, and uh, asset classification standstill by excluding the moratorium period of three months, etc., by the term lending institutions by another three months, taking the total period of applicability of measures to six months from March 1st to August 31st, 2020. The lending institutions were also permitted to convert the accumulated interest on working capital facilities over the total deferment period of six months into a funded interest term loan and group exposure limits of the banks were increased from 25 to 30% of eligible capital base for enabling the corporates to meet their funding requirements. These 10 measures which I have tried to cover in brief have significantly eased the financing conditions and helped new issuances and enabled flow of liquidity to the various financial market segments. During the COVID period alone, the Reserve Bank has injected around rupees six and a half lakh crores of liquidity into the banking system through various operations which I have referred to above. The current level of surplus liquidity in the system has ensured that the overnight market rates such as the weighted average call rate have remained anchored to the policy rate and are mostly lower than the policy repo rate. Uh, it has encouraged markets to actually diversify their investments into other sectors so that they can get slightly higher yield than the yields which are available in the market money market rates uh, segment sorry conducive liquidity conditions have not only ensured complete transmission of monetary policy action in the short short term rates it has also brought down yields on several other instruments we have seen that the interest rate on the certificate of deposits uh, has decreased significantly the yields on three and nine month cds have fallen below the policy rate in fact, the yield on three-month CD rates fell below the reverse repo rates in the last few days. As regards short-term financing conditions for corporate entities, as a result of our policy intervention, CP issuances have improved by 50% in March 2020 over the previous month. The yields on CPs in the primary markets have also dropped in tandem with other short-term interest rates, while the yield for select categories of participants dropped even below the overnight policy repo rates. On account of the Reserve Bank intervention, the GSEC yields, that is the risk-free rates for the domestic financial markets have dropped to its lowest in more than a decade. 
as the GSEC yield curve forms the base for pricing all market instruments, the decrease in yield of the GSEC has had a corresponding impact on the yields of corporate bonds and other instruments, enhancing market asset access and bolstering the effect of policy easing. Since the start of the year, the three-year GSEC yield has dropped by about 180 basis points and the 10-year yield has dropped by about 75 basis points despite considerable increase of the government borrowings and also the, sorry, then the borrowing costs in the corporate bond markets have also dropped to their lowest in the decade on the back of abundant liquidity provided through the generic LTROs as well as the targeted LTROs. The risk premiums which have surged post COVID-19 as investors fear default due to revenue loss streams, loss of revenue streams has also improved. The spread of three-year AAA bonds over the similar tenor government securities has improved from 320 basis points as of March 26, 2020 to around 85 basis currently for the NBFCs. Similarly, for corporate borrowers, the spread has dropped to around 75 basis points compared to the spread of 276 basis points on March 26. For the PSU FI banks, it has dropped to about 10 basis points from 216 basis points on March 26, 2020. The primary corporate bond market has become more broad based with non AAA rated entities being able to raise funds. The primary issuances has jumped by about 30% in the first quarter of 2021 to more than 2 lakh crores as compared to the corresponding quarter in the previous year. There has been tremendous improvement in the secondary market activity in the corporate bond markets also in the last few months. The COVID-19 has been an extraordinary economic shock which has caused possibly a, quite a deep depressive recession not seen since the Great Depression and its impact we are still to, it is yet to play out fully. The unprecedented nature of shock needed unprecedented macroeconomic policy support to elevate its impact on the people and the economy. Reserve Bank has been working in a mission mode to ensure that the financial markets and institutions function normally and financial, that financial stability was preserved. All conventional and unconventional tools deployed have sought to engender conducive financial conditions by providing adequate system liquidity as well as targeted liquidity to sectors and entities experiencing liquidity constraints and or hindrances in market access. These measures together with the several measures announced by the government of India as part of the economic stimulus have ensured that liquidity issues do not cascade into a solvency problem and that the viable firms are not deprived of survival funding and growth capital. While the economic outlook remains uncertain and crystallization of the real economic costs of the pandemic may take some time, uh, protecting lives, meeting the survival needs of the people and improving the healthcare systems remain priorities. At the same time, effective macroeconomic policies are crucial to prevent much worse outcomes. We know that the world and India will not remain in the grip of COVID-19 forever. Like so many other infectious diseases, the ingenuity of humankind will successfully contain it and we'll learn to how to live with it. In the not too distant future, this pandemic will end too. So some combination of treatments, vaccines and achievement of herd immunity. Further, future economic policies need to be tailored towards supporting the economy as and when the effects of the pandemic fade. Thank you. Now, I think this is all I had to say. I hope, uh, I don't know whether I can still get my, <laughs> mug on the screen but i'm not very sure but i still see the okay any issues from your side or if you would like to respond well thank you very much sir for um, uh, that um, uh, clearly the reserve bank of india and have been doing a great deal to uh, to ensure that the impact of this uh, you know pandemic is managed uh, as best as one can. And I think the entire banking system, um, you know, uh, has has benefited from the very rapid response that uh, both the regulator as well as the government has taken in this regard. Um, we had a couple of uh, queries which uh, we wanted to actually uh, put before you. One of the oh. issues that we are finding, uh, perhaps I can ask my colleague, uh, Mr. Sachinanath, who 
who actually brought this subject up. Um, you know, uh, it is in the context of the fact that you know risk aversion is quite uh, quite large uh, with all the bankers today, and uh, given the uncertainty in the economic environment, bankers as well as you know non-bank finance companies are finding it difficult to take a call on the risk, and uh, we we were wondering whether incremental uh, you know sovereign support would be possible. So. Mr. Nath, why don't you put the case forward uh, in your inimitable, inimitable style? <laughs> thanks, thanks, Mr. Shashadri. Uh, Mr. Rao, uh, it is a pleasure uh, to be here with you. Uh, so I represent uh, the non-bank finance sector and especially the uh, NBFC which support the SME and micro SME given that we are a platform dedicated to, to finance uh, the MSME segment in India. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, we were discussing our panel that uh, we look at this, uh, the, uh, the entire pandemic situation and post-COVID, the entire focus uh, till date have been uh, to provide liquidity support to bring financial stability to, especially to the NBFC market. And some of the ma measures and the amount of liquidity which has been provided uh, have been really helpful. And I think so broadly, the financial system is quite stable now. But majority of the uh, the scheme which has been provided, whether it is the refinancing scheme through CSP, partial credit guarantee scheme by RBI, all have been till date geared towards maintaining the you know liquidity, health, and preventing the default risk. Uh, and one of the suggestion was that I think so it is the time in the next review to find ways to provide liquidity for incremental credit growth, especially for SME and micro SME segment. Uh, and one of the suggestion uh, which uh, which I, I just made to Mr. Shishadri also uh, uh, through SOCM that we should uh, we should bring it to the government that we believe that the next decade uh, there uh, there is an opportunity for deep collaboration between small NB or mid-size NBFC and large banks, and one of this collaboration would come through the co-lending arrangement. The current structure of the co-lending, the way it has been designed, uh, it does not allow banks to get any form of credit support uh, and it is it is tight uh, it is defined by the, the co-lending circular so when a bank large bank lend to an nbfc it has a cap you know uh, the capital adequacy support available with the nbfc but the same is not available when you know it's a it's a co-lending arrangement so the, the co-lending arrangement if that can be you know if the rbi can allow banks to take commercial decision wherein NBFC can provide credit support in terms of the co-lending, banks would start relying upon NBFC's underwriting parameter and start co-lending. So that should fuel the availability of the liquidity on an off-balance sheet mode. Uh, that's a suggestion uh, and a request. And second, all the existing measures which has been taken now, if there is a thinking that how to provide incremental liability side or liability availability for for incremental credit rather than just managing the existing asset liability mismatches. No, I think uh, you'll appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Rao, you are very Yeah, I think I am visible, right? Uh, finally. Hello. Okay. Yes, you are. Yeah. Ah. Very happy okay. to have you. Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, we need to appreciate that uh, this COVID has been, uh, I mean, the way the, uh, what do you call the pandemic has spread out, uh, we have to actually play quite a bit by the year because the way it has uh, unraveled or spread across the country is something which uh, nobody could have predicted. And uh, so the reactions or responses have been to the immediacy of the situation which we needed to handle. And the yes. in immediate impact of the lockdown was in terms of the impact on the real sector as well as on the financial markets. The first set of responses essentially was to ensure that the markets continued to function. So most of the measures in terms of the long-term repo operations, the targeted operations, etc., was to immediately address this issue. Uh, the second segment is we have to see the how the impact is going to be there on the economic activities of the various players going forward. And uh, I think once we get a uh, what do you call fix on this issue, perhaps the responses, policy responses would could be appropriately tailored. So I think we'll have to see how the situation evolves and then based on the evolving situation, the policies could be suitably modified to address the concern. So whatever suggestions you have given on these issues, I think uh, 
they are well made and i think uh, we would have to really look at those issues and see how it can be taken forward but i think it will all depend on how the situation evolves going forward well, I, i think that is uh, that's a point well made sir it depends it's a rapidly evolving situation and uh, how it evolves as we, as uh, as time goes by is something that we'll have to see and take appropriate policy measures um though the nature of the challenge continues to be quite daunting and uh, well, you know one must again uh, uh, put on record uh, i think the entire financial services systems uh, gratitude to the uh, reserve bank as well as the, uh, the government of india to for its you know very rapid reaction uh, but the challenge continues and i think one of the issues that we are facing is that access to incremental credit uh, other than where the state or the sovereign is taking the risk is very very limited at this point in time and if growth has to come back uh, access uh, has to has to be brought back in some form and that was the subject that we were debating so i no, think I we th are yeah go ahead sir please go ahead sir no no i think uh, you can please complete i will respond there after no 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 i am done sir please you go ahead ah. no no as i said uh, the immediate requirement is to address the health issues and check the expansion i mean uh, growth of the pandemic across all the geographical area of india and also see what are the kind of solutions which can be worked out to contain the pandemic as well as perhaps uh, with the growth of i mean alternative of vaccines etc hopefully the problem can get resolved in the near future so once the immediate priority of addressing the health issues is sorted out as i said second step would be to ensure the sustainability of the existing businesses so i think maybe we need to approach it stage by stage so the first priority at this juncture is going to be on the health as health and protection of the people maybe the second uh, once we are able to ensure some, we have some degree of comfort on that aspect the second segment will come into play and i think both the government and rbi would be open to whatever measures uh, we need to take i think uh, the suggestions which come from the people as well as what are the requirements which we assess i think those would be taken i think uh, governor and others are quite responsive and quite aware of the situation and they will really look at what is needed to be done and take an appropriate view on the matter we appreciate that so allow me to thank you on behalf of vaso cham and on behalf yeah. of the panel for taking the time to be here with us we really appreciate it uh, it's been um, uh, actually um, Uh, a very very useful few hours in which uh, we've uh, spent a great deal of time discussing what needs to be done and how the banking system can help do it and uh, it was then uh, you know the icing on the cake was your address we really appreciate it uh, i want to put on record uh, my thanks to the assocham team for uh, for making this possible and i also want to thank all the panelists who are here today and uh, all the people who tuned in to listen to us and watch us so thank you very much mr rao and uh, thank you very much to all of you thank you thank you, thank you for having thank me you. thank you very much thank you thank you thank you so much thank you thank you so i'm signing off thank you yes sir thank you i'm also signing off thank you so much everybody pleasure meeting you Thank you Mr. Thank you. Rao it was a pleasure to hear you thank, thank you, you Mr. Sesh okay नहीं नहीं सर आई नो कि वो आवर मैनेज करना इतना आसान नहीं है